I received a three-page fax from a man named Deke Richards about, uh, oh, I don't know, several days ago, of an absolutely riveting fax detailing a, 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 what do you want to call it, a crash and a retrieval in Germany. Might as well call it what it is, it, it, the Fulda Gap area. Now, I wanted to bring Deke back on. There's been deep interest from high up in the UFO community. So, Deke, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, excellent. This is, oh, I like regular phones so much better than cell phones, Deke. It does sound better, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, much better. All right, what I would like you to do now, relax, take a deep breath, and unwind this story for me. Uh, if you, where, where did you grow up, Deke? I grew up in Maine. In Maine. So yeah, I'm way up there in the confines of northern Maine on a dairy farm. So then you've always sort of been in that area. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, um, definitely. And, except when you went into military service. When, when was that? I went into the military. I first originally joined when I was in high school still on a delayed entry program. Well, you, were, I, you uh, were really anxious, weren't you? <laughs> well, you know they have Armed Forces Day there at the high school, you know. Uh, what year was that? Do you remember? 1979. 1979. Yeah, uh, right after I graduated, they didn't waste no time sending me into boot camp. <laughs> Fort Lost in the Woods, Missouri, down there in Missouri. Uh-huh. And well, we called it Fort Lost in the Woods, Missouri, but that's Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Well, I was, in, I was in the Air Force. I was in basic training, and I know the misery, so I'd, I'd go with that. <laughs> anyway... Listen, uh, you you joined, you went through some sort of tech school probably? Right. I, I took, um, I went down there to, uh, I did my AIT down there in Fort Leonard Wood as well. That's uh, my advanced individual training. Mm -hmm. well, and I and, went to... Uh, and what, what was that for? Uh, recovery. Recover. Recovery. Recovery. Yes. yes. Uh, my MOS was a 63 whiskey. 60. At that time, in 79, before they rechanged the uh, numbers of the MOS structures back there in the late 80s there, what? was a 63 whiskey. Right. Recovery of what? Uh, recovery of uh, any wheeled vehicle. Okay. All right. Anything that might get stuck out there or right. crash or have trouble right. or whatever. I knew exactly what I wanted to do do because up there in one of our corn cornfields, a guy got stuck, stuck there one night, and I had to go out there at 2 o'clock in the morning to get him out of there because this... If my father found this guy in our cornfield, he would have had a well butt full of buckshot. <laughs> I hear you. Don't mess, don't mess up our cornfield. Um, all right. What rank did you attain in the military? E6. E6. How long? Oh, E6, huh? Yes. Uh, well, because the cutoff scores were so low, because 63 whiskey, there wasn't that many in the field, so the cutoff scores were very low, and so I made rank quick. Mm -hmm. You were in for how long? I was in for 10 years. 10 years. So yeah, I got out, and uh, I got... Yeah, uh, you can say I went out on early retirement out on my own. Okay. Um, you were assigned in Germany from whence to whence? I was there from December of 79 till April of 84. Four and okay. a half years. Of 84. All right. All right. Now, uh, in your job, uh, in Ger where were you in Germany? Uh, my first duty assignment there in Germany was with the 29th Supply and Service Company in Baumholder. We were up there on top of the hill right there in Wetzel Concern. We shared the concern with the 48th Maintenance Company. Okay, so you um, you did what you normally do. Uh, you retrieved, I take it, normally. Right. Mm -hmm. um, being in a supply and service company there, they had, we had a laundry and bath platoon, and they went out to the field quite often to service other military units, you know, infantry a lot that was, that was in there. And Baumholder was, uh, well, the headquarters for 8th ID was up there in fact Kreuznach, but... The 8th ID, the main contingent of the 8th ID, the 8th Infantry Division, was right there in Baumholder. So our laundry platoon had to go out quite often. <laughs> and so we had a wrecker. Before they changed the T-O-N-E, we had a wrecker. Okay. And um, I was the only 63 whiskey there in the unit, and I was assigned, of course, to the wrecker. How long had you been in Germany when the incident, we'll call it, occurred? Well, let's see. Uh... The incident occurred during reforger of 82, so let's say September. So let's say uh, almost almost uh, three years. Okay. So you had been there almost three years. And then what sends you out on this, uh, on this retrieval, on this mission? Uh, do you get a phone call? Do, do, do you, okay. Well, I'll lay it out for you. All right. Um, the 29th Supply and Service Company during reforger had gotten tasked to support the 11th ACR. 
which is the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment up there in Bad Hirschfeld, Germany. Mm -hmm. And they patrol the 1K zone, you know, the no man's land, the full the gap. Right, full the gap. That's where um, people always speculated a war between uh, uh, Russia and... Um uh, and That's the where the, the first world. ground units would come across. That's where it would all begin. That's right. Okay. So we're standing in the chow line there at old morning 30, 0600, I guess it was. I don't, I don't, I don't remember there. But um, I was still outside the uh, tent when uh, we heard this. When we heard this big, huge bang and a thud. That's okay, and right. You could feel the vibration right underneath your feet. Uh huh. And I was still outside the door of the tent, like I, like I said, and I managed to wait, wheedle my way through the chow line. Everybody's wondering what that was, what that was. So I'm sitting down. I'm just, just about ready to dig into that wonderful Army SOS when the first sergeant came up to me and he says, we got to go see the CO now. What rank were you at that point, do you recall? E4. E4. Right. E4 on E5 list. Right. All okay. right. Sure. And so the um, first sergeant said, well, obviously, when the first sergeant tells you to jump, you jump. That's right. So I went. And inside, when, when we got into the CO's tent, now you understand, we were out in the field, so we had everything was in a tent. Right. And so I went into the CO's tent, and he's on the phone with these people. I had no idea who he was on the phone there with. CO hung up the phone, and he told me to go get my wrecker ready and stand by. Okay. okay, so I went out and I fired it all up and checked everything out and made sure everything was okay. And I'm sure you're thinking, you're probably, were you relating it to the boom at that point, thinking, well, maybe I'm going to go get whatever it is that fell down, crashed? Well, not at this particular junction because there was a lot of jumping around there because you had a lot of recovery to do because people were getting stuck up there and everything else gotcha. all the time. All right, so no connection yet. Right. right. So, go ahead. But the first sergeant bit was, un was unusual, but no connection yet. Right, okay. Okay, so then the 48th maintenance wreckers coming right up by me, and um, instead of saying the record, can I say his? Can I just call him? Can I say his first name? Yeah. Okay. His name was Mike. Okay. And um, so anyway, Mike. You have, you have and I a pretty. Uh, let me stop you. You have a really good memory. I, I I take it that called to do so, you could remember Mike's last name no problem. Yes. Oh, okay. Mike and I are still friends today. All right. Oh. He doesn't know I'm doing this. <laughs> well, he might now. He might now. All right. Anyway, continue. Okay. Um, so Mike and I were standing out there. We're wondering what's going on. And uh, I says, did you tell him, did you get any word? No, I just told Pierce, stand here and wait. So two jeeps come up and a deuce and a half come up. And then a hat pulling a D7 bulldozer mm -hmm. from the 293rd Engineers. And... So then two helicopters fly in. Now, from this time to this time now, it's probably about an hour and a half. Okay. Because it's not too far past, past Chow. Okay. And um, I managed to grab me a piece of French toast anyway. But, um, yeah. So anyway, these two helicopters fly in. And there are people jumping off that helicopter in Army fatigues. Now, at that time, we didn't have the BDUs. Okay, we still had the regular straight style fatigues. Right. And but the weird thing about these people was is that they had no insignia, no U.S. Army, no U.S. Air, nothing on their suits at all. Yeah, that's really weird. No military insignia at, at all. And the officer that was in the first helicopter, he comes over to us and he says, "Follow us, gentlemen." He gets into the jeep and we're trekking across the field. And because we had the hat with us. You know, which is a heavy equipment transport. At that time, it was an M920 was the, nom was the nomenclature. Right. And, you know, that can only travel 15 to 20 miles an hour when it's going cross country. Right. Okay. And it took us about maybe a half an hour to get to where we were. What kind of, you didn't have what, no problem what finding kind of, out where you, What kind of terrain is this? Well, it's a field. It's an open field at first. Okay, and then it goes into a small wooded area. Uh -huh. And then once we got to the wooded area, we had no problem figuring out what we were going after because the trail this thing led was incredible. So you were beginning to see what? A, a, a debris trail? Or... Right, we were beginning to see a debris trail. Could you and, what, make out pieces of metal at that point? What were you no, no, no pieces of metal at that particular junction because we're right there up, up front. 
okay, and we stopped. And because they had to unload the bulldozer, okay, because, I mean, trees were just, I'm talking great big, humongous fir trees. I mean, trees you can't get your arms around. These things were 50 to 60 feet tall, and they were uprooted. It was incredible. I okay. mean, the trees were down. I mean, bang, boom, some of them were cut right in half. All right, Are you, but in an obvious trail? Yes, it was an obvious trail right through the woods. All right. Right through the woods. So the bulldozer was there to plow up the trees. Even 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 that little D7, being the workhorse as it is, it, it had trouble moving some of them big fir trees. Right. And so the jeeps were following first, and then it was the two wreckers, and then it was the... Um, and then it was the distant half behind the uh, wreckers that had the personnel in it. All right. So we're going for about 150 yards. And then he stops and tells us to put on our gas mask. Well, anybody that's ever been out in the field, you always have your web gear and your gas mask with, with you. And so we had to put our gas mask on. Mm -hmm. So we drove up another 20 yards, and then he made the dismount signal, and we all dismounted, got out of the wrecker and everything else. The bulldozer is continuing up. Now, at this point, the only thing that we could see was this huge, shiny thing sticking out of the ground. Okay? I personally call it. It looked like stainless steel. Okay? All right. Uh, when you say huge, how big? Well, uh, just a, just a guess, flatbed, I guess. Uh, pardon me? Just a guess, I guess. Well, when, well, when they put it on the flatbed, the flatbed, they had to bring in a special flatbed because of the length. It was a 60-foot flatbed. Right. Okay, um, what they do, the Army's got these stretch flatbeds. Oh, yes. where They can stretch them out because the frame right. moves. Okay, right. and they had to move that out to 60 feet. Okay. Okay, and um, so the width of this thing was about 60 feet wide. And so we're going in there. Circular? Uh, well, <laughs> after, we got it out, after we got it out of the ground, I like to call it an, an oval triangle. Because you take a triangle and just round off the edges, yeah, and that's and, and that's what you had. And the nose of this thing was buried straight down into the dirt. Okay, I, mean, I, okay, I can picture that. Sure, incredible. It was just buried right down into the dirt. What? How much of it was buried? Half of it. Half of it. All right. Yes. Yes. Half okay. of it. That's a that's a lot. So there was a lot of that craft in the dirt. Yes, there was. Yes. All right. Yes, there was, and it was very it was very because because at the about the last hundred yards or so. Uh -huh. I mean, it dug a trench. It dug a trench like like you went in there with a bulldozer for a couple of days and just kept up piling up dirt. You know, the banks were as the further in you went, the, the higher the banks went. That was and amazing. I mean, there was roots all over the place and everything else. It, it, it was just incredible the destruction this thing did. How many of how many personnel on the scene at this point? As at, when you at, were well, at this point, with the people in the deuce and a half and the guys in the jeep and Mike and I, there's about twenty. 20. All right. There's about 20, and we all walked up there. We all walked up to where this craft was, mm -hmm. and that's when we saw the bodies. That's when we saw the bodies. The bodies were on completely on the left side of the craft, and it was it was like they were trying to walk out of the craft, and then they just fell dead in their tracks. And there was a strong smell of ammonia protruding from these bodies. All right. Now you didn't say that last time. No, because I forgot about it. it. They smelled like ammonia, huh? Yes, they did. There was a strong smell of ammonia. So it's like they they walked off the craft, uh, took a couple of whiffs of atmosphere, and fell over. I mean, I'm not saying that's why, but... Right. But well, well, there was some that obviously, obviously made it further. They weren't staggered right in, right in a line. Um, the furthest one away was about 35 to 40 feet. Uh-huh. Okay, and the closest one was about 5 feet. All right. And and he was trying and he was right up against he was right up against the bank, and I'm assuming he he just ran out of gas when he tried to climb up the bank because the other ones were able to make get up the bank. All right, so they were just scattered about how many total? Five of them. Five bodies. Five, All right. Five of them. Deke, hold it right there. All right, now back to Deke Richards, uh, who's at a very public place right now, uh, on the road, and uh, trying to get the story out and doing a damn good job of it uh, at that. Deke, uh, you're back on the air. And yes. so here, this craft is halfway into the earth. You've got bodies, of five of them strewn about, and take it from there. Well, after the all-clear was given, they had to bring in a radiation team to check for radiation. And now you're well into the day now. 
you know, everything's well into the day. They had to wait on, they had to wait for the body bags. We had the all clear so we could remove our gas masks. That's how we knew the smell of ammonia. And, you know, if you got too close to these things, you would, your throat would start to burn, your nostrils and everything. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been close to ammonia? It just yes, knocks I you have. right off your feet. I That's have, basically yeah. what had happened. So the guys that were putting the bodies in a formation type so they could put them in the body bags still had to wear their gas masks. What kind of guys are these? Uh, were they... uh, these were the guys that were in the deuce now, just regular soldiers there. All right. E3s, E4s, you know, gotcha. guys, just guys from different units that and... were just sent down there to help. Right. And where are these people who didn't have an insignia at this point? Well, they're the ones giving all the orders, and they're down there giving a close inspection of the uh, craft. All right. And there was, there was three of them. All right. Okay. One of the guys was over there at the bodies. The other one was over here talking to the bulldozer driver at, at, at this time. And um, the other one was over here talking to Mike and I how they were going to, how they wanted to do this. And um, You mean retrieve the craft? Right. All right. How did, and, so how did you go about it? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the bulldozer had to dig, had to dig away some of, the, had to dig away some of the earth and had to make a trail so the wreckers could come in there. Now you got to keep in mind something. People would be saying, "Well, why didn't they use helicopters?" Well, you're talking about a wooded area. You're talking about fir trees that are 50 to 60 to 70 feet high. Gotcha. So you know a chopper wouldn't be very effective. So we had to uh, wait for the bulldozer to get to where we get the wreckers in, in in position. Meanwhile, Mike and I we had to take our spade shovels and we had to dig underneath the craft so we could put slings underneath there. They didn't want to use any metallic objects, mm -hmm. you know, like a hook or a chain or anything else like that. They wanted us to use our canvas slings. So they had to bring them in special, okay? So we, so you're waiting most of the day for the body bags and this stuff. And in other words, else. there was a lot of time in between, right? Right, exactly. Um, might, I, exactly. Might, might I ask, uh, just very briefly, what in God's name were you guys talking about when you had a little time to talk? I mean, you must have said, what the hell are <laughs> we doing? What to say, Art. I mean, you get it. You get to Take this in mind. I am just a backwards country boy from Maine. Grew up on a dairy farm, and I'm thrust into this situation right here. I know, but and still. I am just. I, I had to repeat my name over and over and over again. I had to help Mike. Mike, punch me. Make sure I'm still awake, please. You know, and, and Mike was just taking it in stride. Yeah, right. He was. Did he punch you? Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> remember. All right. Um, so anyway. You, you guys, do you know what you're dealing with? I mean, obviously, these are not well, humans. It's a, it's a spaceship. I want to say that the official news release was an F-4 aircraft. And I can tell you right now, this is not an F-4 aircraft. I'm with you there. So they, mean, they said you know, it's like, they said something it's like my crashed. little niece goes. They said something crashed, but they said an F-4. Right. Uh, and, and like my little niece goes, duh. Duh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, describe as best you're able these creatures. Okay. Um, now, I was at no closer than four or five feet to these things. Pretty close. Yeah, exactly. And one of them was laying down on its, it was on its side, but it was face down in the dirt. And they had, it, they were gray in color, and they had big heads like a small pumpkin. Uh-huh. Their fingers were... Their fingers were skinny and long, mm -hmm. and they had black suits on. Black it, suits. Yes, black suits, black skin tight suits, like uh, which, like which like covered the their whole aerobic workers in yeah. in, in, in leotards. Yeah. There you go, there yeah. you go. Like leotards. All right. That's what I. Yeah, that's the word I was trying to use but before was leotards. You could. So then, your discernment of their skin color was from seeing either their face or just the, just the head. Well, I didn't see their face. Or or, or okay, then just the, face the head. Is, the, the faces were down. In, the heads were, were down in the dirt. The heads were hairless. Yes. And they were gray. Yes. Okay. They were. They were gray. Right. And they had the black leotard suits on. And the one that was on its side had this on the um, on its chest. It had this weird this, this weird writing. I mean it. I mean you know I'm familiar with this relic alphabet. Uh, you know the Russian alphabet. The you know, the backwards letters, the, you know, you see hieroglyphics and everything else, but this resembled nothing I've ever seen, okay? Uh, and it just looked like some kid had drew a design on there and end the story. You mean and, sort of like just a scribble design? Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't have the vocabulary to put this into words, you know, and still still to this day, right. still to this day, it, it 
gets, you know, it upsets me when I speak about the Could Bible. Could you take because a... Because they're freaking me out. Could you take a piece of paper and... Uh, in your mind's eye, and could you draw something that would approximate it? I could. I could. Okay. Because I've seen it for every day for the last 20 years. I hear you. All right. All right. So you went busy uh, trying to get straps. Right, right. So the, so the other deuce and a half had come in. He had finally come in with the body bags, and he had these, and he had these chests with them, too. And, uh, you, know, they were, you know, they were metal coffins, okay? Right. They were the metal coffins that they shipped. Right. And they had ice, so we had to go up there and help them because they had our straps in there, too. So that's when I got close to the bodies. All right. Okay, when I was unloading the deuce and a half, and, and that's when I was right there with the bodies. Right. And then when, that's when they had them all in the formation and everything else. Then I got then I got out of there. Then I got out of there because I couldn't stand the ammonia, and I don't want to put that damn gas mask on. Yep. Back on. All right, so you're out of there. You're, you're back to your job. Yes, and I'm back at my job. I got, I, I got the slings. Meanwhile, the guys are putting the bodies in ice and filling them up with ice, and they put them on the deuce and a half, and off the deuce and a half went. And then I'm, Mike and I, we grabbed our shovels, and we were figuring out, you know, because, you know, that's our MOS. Right. We're figuring out how, how are we going to do this. Well, obviously, we couldn't move it. The thing that we were going to have to do is just lift it up, turn it so the flatbed could back right, in, right underneath it and put it onto the flatbed. Gotcha. That was that was the game plan. All right. So we had to dig underneath the craft so we could put the sling underneath there. Right. You know, and both, both Mike and I, we got space shovels, and we're by ourselves. And and so the guys come over, and they called it a day for this day. They brought in tent. They weren't going to let nobody leave. And they called in other guys, and they set up tents and everything else for us. They brought in chow and the whole, and the whole nine yards, and we had to spend a night in a tent there, too. We weren't allowed to go back to our garrison. We weren't allowed to do nothing except just stay right so, there. Until that job was done, that's where you were. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And all the time in the tent, there's three of us in that one tent. We were fortunate because we had a smaller tent, and they bought in the cots, and and uh, we, were just, we didn't say nothing to nobody. We were just sitting in there looking at each other, just wondering what's going on here. Are, are we, you know, where are we? But and so anyway, the next day we're out there and, and and we finally got enough dug underneath there where we could put the sling on each side of these things and we positioned the wreckers out. One nice thing about the five ton wrecker, it's very very versatile. It's got many many purposes, many uses. Right. And by using boom supports and everything else, you drastically increase the capacity. Maybe so. Of this the would boom winch. This would be a first time use, though. I have a feeling. A first time use. Yeah. Uh, to pick one of these up? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All yeah. right, Any, anyway. Yeah, first time. Anyway, I remember when you told the story before, you talked about some tubes, and you said when you got down oh. low, when you were digging yes. in, you actually got to sort of look into a part of the craft that... Okay, um, now the left side, when you're looking at it from from behind, the left side, which is the same place where the, where the, um, where the uh, people came out, okay? All right. Yeah. Uh, you can call them extraterrestrials. I just call them people. And anyway, there was these five, about, I'd say about five inch in diameter tubes coming out of coming out of the side because there was a gash in there. And I'm just assuming my own personal assumption that this happened when it hit them big fir trees. Well, the gash in the craft, how how big was that? Oh, it went down into the dirt, obviously out, but, but the part that was showing was about 20 feet. 20 feet. About plenty big enough the, for uh, these beings to come out, um, or... Well, no, the beings didn't come out of the gash. Oh, they didn't? No, the beings come out of a door. A door, all right. So this was a separate uh, opening, uh, unintended opening, we'll say. Yes, because the, the trees, I, I'm assuming, I'm just assuming that the trees caused it. Okay. okay. And there was no burn marks or nothing like that. All right, and you could, you did get one look sort of up in there at well, one point? Well, the... Uh, you literally had to lay down on the ground. My ear had to touch the dirt to look up inside. Uh -huh. And all I could see from where I was, from, from my vantage point, because most of the gas was down inside the dirt, but the tubes were coming out of the dirt, out of the craft, and it had this green ooze coming out of them, and it wasn't gushing out of there like a fire hose. It was just dripping out of there. Anything? Uh, did it smell of anything? Or? No, it didn't smell, but it was very luminescent at night. You could see the trail of it coming back in from about 150 yards out there. You could just see where 
had touched one of the trees and it, and it was drooping off one of the trees. That's you know, very interesting. Yep. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> excuse me. So, the uh, the tubes were out there, and I, I mean, they weren't in any kind of order or anything like that. They were all over the place. They were all over the place. But what I could see from from up inside, now personally, with my mechanical background and my knowledge of mechanics, I personally thought that this was the engine room. And uh, what you could see up inside there was was this great big humongous just. I mean, because it was dark inside there, right? So you got to understand that, right? And I didn't shine my flashlight up under underneath there because I was in cramped quarters, okay? Because my ear was right down into the dirt when I'm taking one eye and being able to look up inside this. Gotcha. With the tubes out and so you can didn't you, you, really can you can huh? really barely see up into it. Right, right. But what I could see it was huge. Any details you were able to make out at all? Was it just a giant empty room? No. Well, no, it wasn't empty. I'm, 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 I mean, there was there was plainly machinery in there, some kind of machinery. As, that's what I'm saying. Is, is that there was some kind of machinery in there? Right. See, I'm lost for my vocabulary again. And that's uh, all right. So no machinery. grinding gears or anything like that. But it was just it looked like um, just an engine room, just okay. an engine room with a face on with a with, with a face on it. Okay, um, what I'm talking about, but a face, but a bulkhead maybe. There, there you go. A right. bulkhead. A bulkhead. All right. Right. Okay. And then at the edge of the bulkhead, there was this, there was this machinery. Okay. And it was like I've never seen nothing like this before in my whole entire life. I, I, I mean, you know, it didn't resemble a 454 Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep my sense of humor. Yeah, please do. That's fine. Uh, so, anyway, your main job, you, you got the, you, you obviously were able fi finally to lift this thing all the way out. Right. Right. And were, obviously, at that point, you'd be able to see very clearly its shape, right? Exactly. Exactly. Because meanwhile, while we're out there, you got guys with brooms on top of this thing trying to dig off the dirt. And one thing I didn't mention before, too, is that whenever you hit this thing with a shovel. Yes. I mean, you know, just just because I, I did that a couple of times. Right. You know, it would have a nick in it. Then after you bring the shovel back down, the nick would be gone. Really. The nick would be totally gone. I mean, like I said, In other words, like it very, did, very flexible. It, it, it sort of reshaped itself. It reshaped itself. Now, I didn't want to say that, but... Again, and that's all right. I don't mind. Um, the, the shape of the craft, though, when you had it fully up and you could really take a good look at it as it was going to the flatbed, uh, you would, again, describe it as a, a triangle. As a triangle. But with... It what? was rounded edges. Rounded edges. Right. It was an oval. It was an oval triangle. Okay. With, with a, it was an oval with a point with like. like okay. A, no, I can draw. I can draw what I'm able. You took to... some silly putty yep. and rolled it up and made yourself an oval and then took one end and tried to stretch that out a little bit. What would you have? You'd have an yeah. oval triangle. Yeah, that's right. No, I with I've rounded got... edges. That there you go. I just did it myself and I see exactly what it was like. Right, and it, so... and it was oh, I'd say probably ten feet tall. Ten, ten feet tall at the uh, at, at its tallest point, uh -huh. and it narrowed down to about six feet tall in the nose. All right, you've already given me one very unusual thing about its uh, makeup. It's it's metal or whatever it was. It was shiny. The skin, and it was shiny. Shiny like stainless steel. I mean, there was no burn marks or anything on it, but it was shiny like stainless steel. That's my word, Art. Have there been any um, apparent fire? No. No I mean, fire. There was no burn marks on it whatsoever. I mean, there was there wasn't a scratch on this thing, except for the gash that was on the side where the tubes were coming out, mm -hmm. and that's where some of the metal. Okay, so there must have been some debris there. Yes, there was. Yes, yes, there was. About about the last eighty to fifty yards or so, there was there was debris from the first or second tree. That's why I'm assuming that the gash happened because of the trees. Because if you know anything about fir trees, they're going to stand there like an oak. <laughs> what, uh, what happened to the um, uh, to the, you know, the smaller pieces of metal? Well, that's when the troops were out there picking them up. They were doing police call. One of the uh, one of the uh, can I call them government gurus? If you wish. Okay, one of the government gu gurus was out there instructing them to pick up every, every little piece, no matter how minute, how many little pieces, and they had uh, little little trash bags to put to, to put them in. I mean, to say the least. And and they had probably 
probably 20 guys out there. Hmm. It looked like they had a whole platoon out there picking up these little bitty pieces and putting them into these bags, and he said, no pieces on left. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, Mike and I, we got the craft up, and we had to spin it around. So one of us had to drop our wrecker. One of us had to drop our end after we got it out of the dirt and after they got all the dirt off of it and everything else. And the uh, I had to take my wrecker a- a- around with the sling still hooked up, and I spun it around. Mike came around with his boom, and then he lifted it up. And so we're sitting there, and then the flatbed backed right underneath it. Mm-hmm. And then we dropped it right down onto the flatbed, and it took them at least two hours to tarp this thing because it was definitely oversized for the flatbed. And uh, they had to wait for, I'm assuming that they had to wait for clearance and everything else to take it down the Audubon. That was that was the main clear thing that they were going to do. They had to go right down the Audubon? Oh, well, that's what I'm assuming, that they had to take it down the Audubon. How else were they going to get it down wherever they were taking it to? <laughs> I've seen okay, a lot I mean, of... They brought it in on a truck. Yeah, I've seen a lot of weird stuff uh, on the interstates. It's always covered with tarp, and you always go, oh, man, I wonder they what that is. To, you know, <laughs> they had to build with two-by-fours. Yeah. Something to take away the silhouette of this thing. They, I, I mean, the tarp was on was not on the craft. It was on two by fours. They were constructing a something to take away the silhouette, so they could transport it down the highway. Mm-hmm. And we're there during this whole thing because now we're in the third day. By the time this is all going on and everything else, and. They were waiting for darkness to take that thing out of there. I mean, they took it out into the field, and they had an MP perimeter around this whole area. And they didn't want to work at night because they didn't want to draw attention right. to, to, to anything. That, hey, I'm just assuming that, you know. Hey, I was in the military. I know these things. And uh, so anyway, that, that was a stupid statement. <laughs> All right, don't worry about it. Just let this story unwind the way it's going to unwind. So anyway, at the end of the third third day, they brought in a sanitation team. Okay, now these were, I'm assuming they're government gurus too. These guys are specialists. You know, they brought these all, all in. They got they got two bulldozers in there now. They're, they're, they're covering in the hole. They're, they're taking the trees away. I mean, they cut them up, you know, with chainsaws. They're taking the trees away and dump trucks. I mean, they're just sanitizing this whole area. Were there officers of, of rank there? At yes, there were officers there. Of what rank? Uh, one was a full bird colonel. Full bird. One and, was a full bird colonel. And he was directing matters. He was directing the matter, and he was in and out. He was also he was he was he was in and out. All right, uh, hold it right there. D, can you hold on? Sure. All right, hold on. Every, all my guests are going to get pushed a little bit, so everybody just hang in there. I want to get this story start to finish uh, very carefully, and that's what we're doing right now. All right, uh, notification to all that we're going to be just pushing guests as we have to to get this done. We have an update coming from Richard C. Hoagland on the incredible story ongoing from the Antarctic coming up immediately following this right now. And then, of course, uh, James Gilliland, uh, and I know I'm saying that wrong, uh, after that. So we're trying to get it all done. Bear with us, everybody. This is important. All right, Deke, you're back on the air again. Hello, Mark. Hi. Um, All right, Deke, um, a few questions for you. Is there any way that you could approximate or guess the weight of the craft? Well, the, uh, the flatbed trailer that they brought in there was a, was a triaxle, and the wreckers were groaning even under the stilts. So, and even with the boom supports on there and everything else, it, it increases the uh, wrecker weight to about 15,000 pounds each. Okay. So, with both wreckers groaning and just... This is just a guess, Art. Right. I would say anywhere between twenty to 30,000 pounds. All right, thanks. That's all I wanted was a guess. Um, yeah. Some people are saying, well, if you hit it with a shovel and it sort of repaired itself or resealed itself... Why was the gas in there? That's right, the big hole. Well, maybe maybe the gas was too big to, to, repair, to repair itself because it tore away some of the matter. I never tore away none of the matter. You would just make an indentation where you hit it with the, with the shovel. You know when you're taking a little sp- small spade and put, thrusting it up. Because you got to understand, I mean, I'm dealing with forest topsoil there with a lot of roots and everything else. So i got to thrust it down in there with, with my boot and everything else. 
Right. So when I'm thrusting it up underneath there, obvious, obviously it's going to make a mark there on the under on the belly side of the craft. Uh huh. All right. Um, were there any German authorities on the site? None. 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 So this there was, was nobody speaking German there whatsoever. Uh, okay, this whatsoever. was all this was all American then all the way. It was all military. They had an MP. They had MPs there. And about this time, after everything was coming down, was there any? Was there, 60, huh? Deke, was there anybody there recording this uh, with uh, on film or any the other? Government media? guru guy was. So there was a recording. Made. Yes, there was. They were taking pictures and everything. Okay. Um, I've got a number of questions. I, I, we've Go got ahead. to eventually close this out, but uh, a number of questions for you. Um, why? After all these years, Deke, uh, an obvious question, are you deciding to tell this story now? Well, Art, I've lived with this for 20 years. And you lived with something like this for 20 years. You want to get it done and get it off, get it off your chest. But this story needs to be told. And I've been out of the, I've been out of the military now since 89. And, you know, you hear a lot of things and everything about the government secrecy and everything else. Look, we have to have secrecy. We have to have it for national security related issues. But something like this, it needs to be told. They're right. out there. All right. We're, once this entire operation was concluded, uh, Deke, yes. was everybody uh, rounded up? Yes, everybody was rounded up. We had to drive back to the garrison area. We weren't allowed to speak to anybody. We were we were put onto a bus out of, out of the field area right. and shipped up the hill to the to the 11th ACR concern, where the 11th ACR was, where they had the, the barracks and everything. Right. And we were put into one barracks. It was the first and the 13th. And we were on the first floor, and they put us all in there. And when, this, when the full bird colonel come walking in, and uh, this was our debriefing. And, well, if you want to call it debriefing, Debriefing what it was. I, I do. Yeah, what, the riot act. Yeah, okay. What did they say to you? Basically? All right. Well, the colonel had come up there, and um, he had paused for a moment, and he had said, "Okay, gentlemen." He said, uh, "What you've seen here today is not to be spoke of outside this room. You're not to speak of it amongst yourselves mm -hmm. to nothing or nobody. Mm -hmm. Not even your wives. Not even your grandchildren." Mm -hmm. And he says, "To do so, you would be." subject to UCMJ, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice, mm -hmm. and I would not hesitate to put one of you away for 20 to 30 years in Fort Leavenworth. And why he's doing that, the government gurus are, are putting, I didn't mention this he, either, we had to sign a, a, we had to sign a, a security agreement. And so, and then he goes on with this. Did you read what you signed? I didn't. It, 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 just, it just, he just said, sign them. This is a, he, he told us this was a security agreement with the United States government, and I'm just summarizing it for you. Okay. And he said, quote, this is on a need to know basis, gentlemen, and I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is nobody in this room or outside this room that has a need to know basis. So, right. in other words, just keep your mouth shut, sign the paper, send them forward. All right. Again, give me the exact date of this crash and uh, the subsequent three days. Now, the date is hard to put down. It happened in late September during Reforger. Late September. Because we had been out there in the field for about two weeks right after this had happened. Uh, so, okay, I would so, say... So, that would, was in 19, say, late September of 1982 during Reforger. That, yes. That, that, that'll pin it down pretty well. Right. Uh, how far, do you remember how far into Reforger it was? Yeah, it was, it was about, I'd say, a good 10 days, right in, right in the thick of things. Okay, that'll nail it down pretty well. Right, right in the thick of things or Reforger. All right. Um, all right, so you signed the security agreement. Everybody properly had the hell scared out of my I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and at that time, you know, I'm still a kid. And you know when this full bird colonel stands stands up there and he's telling and he's telling you this and he's speaking in a real firm voice when he's saying this and, and you don't tell nobody. Yes. And um, that was basically it. I, I've never spoken of the incident until I wrote it down on paper and faxed it to you. All right, you yeah. Yes. What a fax. Uh, then luckily you got through and then finally we've connected with you here on a landline. All right. Um, a couple of additional things. You've kept in contact and still are in contact with your friend Mike? Yes, I am. 
So he's available to um, back up what you say or not? Um, well, I, he doesn't know I'm doing this right now. Well, no, I, I realize that, but yet. I mean, if he were confronted, let's say, uh, you think he would back up your story or he would hold to his security agreement? Well, I owe him a few Charlie horses. I could threaten him with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there are – how many total people would you say, beginning to end – had knowledge of this, uh, direct knowledge, having seen the craft and or 50 the... to 60 people. How many? 50 to 60. 50 to 60. Right. right. 50 to 60, and most of them were just were just ordinary soldiers. Just... All right. We would like these people to get... In no, I'm not counting the government gurus and the officers. Well, they're less likely to talk to us. But 50 to 60 other either enlisted or officers. Right, right. All well, right. they were all soldiers. Yeah, the 50 to 60 were all soldiers. They were from various companies, the 293rd, the 48th, and the 29th. All right. And, but... and our sister company was there, too, the 24th Supply Service out of Keys. All right. So if you were to appeal uh, right now, which is what you can do, uh, to these various groups, you would appeal to what groups? I, I would like uh, anybody out there who lis hears this appeal to email me, Art Bell at mindspring.com, A-R-T-B-E-L-L, -L, at mindspring.com. And who would you appeal to to send me an email to back up your story? I would appeal to anybody that was in the 29th Supply and Service Company, stationed in Baumholder, anybody in the 24th Supply and Service Company, I would have geese, anybody in the 293rd Combat Engineers, and anybody in the 48th Maintenance and anybody that was in the tent that morning that heard that that heard that loud bang and the thud, and um, anybody that knows about this, all right, please contact Art. All right, please. All right, I, I want to additionally inform you that um, Dr. Stephen Greer of CSETI and a man named uh, Dr. Stanton Friedman, who's a nuclear physicist, uh, into this sort of thing, both would like to contact you. Uh, and also, also Linda Moulton Howe, Linda Moulton Howe as well. You may have heard her on my show. Uh, they all would like to speak to you. And uh, I have, of course, your cell phone. So, with your permission, I will. Um, I well, will... currently, right now, I'm I'm, I'm with the, the uh, Department of the Interior in the state of Maine, and I'm down going down to North Carolina to get some uh, get some largemouth bass to introduce them to some of the lakes up there because we have a very poor largemouth bass. I oh, so that's the time. Fish, so that's... when I get home. I mean, they can call me on my home phone number, and I just got that phone hooked up. Uh, but I do have your cell number. And yes, I, sir. I think yes. That, that would be all right, too, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, you most, certain, I just most wanted, certainly may. I wanted to be sure I had permission. Now, you've yes. just identified uh, where you work now. Uh, that, that was up to you. You, you well, said it. Well, that's not a problem. I don't care. I mean, I'm, I mean it's... It, <laughs> You know, if they wanted to figure out, all, all they would have to do is just go back to my military record, find my address in Maine, and go see my folks. And my folks said, oh, he works for the Department of Terrier, Maine. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the repercussions of what you're doing right now might be? I, I don't know. I don't really know. And I'll tell you the truth, I mean, at 20 years, I mean... How, how old are you now? 39. I'm sorry? Well, 39 May 1st. 39, May 1st. Huh? Yeah, the end of the world's coming one year away. Think so? <laughs> 40. 40. Huh? That's a, well, look, you'll, you, you'll do all right. You, you'll make it. Um, so everything you've told me, is there anything that I've missed that was important or critical? No, no, no. Everything. Uh, I, I just wanted to remind you about the ammonia. I, I forgot to tell you about the gas max. And the ammonia. Uh -huh. I mean, I could have wrote you a seven-page fax with everything, but uh, it was sufficient, believe me, to get yeah. me uh, interested. All right, my friend, uh, I'm going to pass this on to people who know how to investigate this sort of thing, and they'll be in touch with you, and they'll be very nice. They're not, uh, uh, they're not uh, Nazi inquisitors, so uh, they'll just ask you some questions, and uh, they'll do it with the background of having heard all of this tonight. All right. One more thing, Art. Yes, Steve. Um, you guys out there that, that know about this, please, please contact Art. If anything, just do it for a fellow soldier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deke. Good night. Talk to you later, Art. Holy smokes. <laughs> so, uh, what do you say to all that? Well, now it's uh, going to get turned over to the uh, the big boys and girls. And we'll see where it goes. But that was a lot of detail. That was a lot of accuracy. 
And I think I believe the man. I don't know, it's like everything else. We submit it to you, the listener, and in this case, others. And we'll see where it goes. But I think you just heard a very important story. Now we're going to switch gears. We're going to be doing a lot of that gear switching tonight. And we're going to get an update on what's uh, going on down at the bottom of the world. It sure is a hell of a mixed-up situation in Antarctica. One story after another, one story contradicting another, even from the websites that are down there. It's incredibly confusing. The lead story nationally right now is about the rescue of the doctor in Antarctica, who I recall Richard saying didn't particularly want to be rescued at all. Here, once again, is Richard C. Hoagland continuing with the story in Antarctica. What's going on there? <laughs> well, good evening, Art. It is going to be an intriguing evening, I think. Already, huh? The last guest was kind of an interesting segue to this because it's now turned into, hold on to your hats, guys, a possible UFO story. <laughs> Remember the the story I told you that's on NPR, on the NPR website, from Richard Harris, uh, who was a science correspondent for NPR. He was at McMurdo in December of 2000, which yes, is just a couple, three months ago. Right. And there was this big rumor going around the base that they were going to have a major UFO landing sometime imminent. And he even found a poster. Well, while he was there, apparently... I, I'm sorry, Richard. What year was this? Uh, December of 2000. 2000, all right. Just before the turn of 2001. Right, gotcha. So it's a couple, three months ago. Okay. Which is kind of the wind-up of summer down there. You know, the, the summer fall season ends in February, so this was, you know, coming to a close of the of another season. How does a rumor, I mean, I, I guess it's silly to ask this question because you never know how rumors get started, but, I mean, this is a big one of a of UFO that's going to land right here in the Antarctic. Well, Antarctic. you know what, what is curious is that Harris Report says that the news itself on base is controlled. There is no free press. It is government. It is the U.S. government running the place. This is a town with 1,200 people during the summer, 85 buildings, you know, hangars and, and uh, you know, astrophysical observatories and chem labs and, you know, people looking at penguins and, and things like that. Right. Um, it's, so it's a, it's a major small town, but it's run by the National Science Foundation, through Raytheon Polar Services, and Harris made a point to say that the official news, you know, what they see on their local TV, what they see on, on their webcast, what they see in their little hand-printed newspaper, is all government controlled. So he said that the major source of news for people is the rumor mill, which is not controlled. <laughs> and then he goes out of his way to point up this story of a major UFO landing over the biggest base in Antarctica, sometime in December. And then he said he found this poster, which I wish he'd send me a copy because I'd like to see what it looked like. And then when they found the culprit, when the authorities, you know, found the culprit, what do they do? They deported the guy back to New Zealand. They kicked him off the continent. Yeah, he actually... They deported him, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and this is on the official NPR website. I mean, I used to do things for National Public Radio. I have friends that are... Right. In high places at NPR, and NPR right. doesn't kind of kid around. So, right. why was this rumor going around? That was kind of in the back of my mind. Well, last night we talked about that the uh, 11 Americans have been flown by the Hercules, the Royal New Zealand Air Force Hercules, successfully on a seven and a half hour flight back from uh, McMurdo to Christchurch, and the four, you know, very ill, injured, whatever you want to call it, Americans, have been put into hospital in Christchurch. And we had our source, one of our three sources now that we have in New Zealand reporting to us on a almost hourly basis. Uh, one of the problems, Art, is that it's, you know, it's on the other side of the world. I know. So when we're awake, they're asleep, and when we're asleep, they're awake. And right. that's been one of the interesting things to get used to here. Anyway, the hospital reported last night that they had lost their critically ill patients. Did they actually report that? Exa had? That is a direct quote. In fact, let me go back in my emails here. <laughs> and pull up the proper email from one of our key sources. These were two of the personnel. Down. These were two of the personnel you reported last night that were critically but stable, uh, critically ill but stable. Yeah, according then, to Raytheon's and, John Shreve, who is the um, he was kind of the personnel commander of the of, of the mission. Yes, he confirmed that two of the personnel were in Christchurch Hospital in quote critical 
but stable condition and added that they were expected to pull through. And so... Um, but down further in my source's email, he says, there is currently some confusion within the hospital about exactly where the critical but stable patients are. <laughs> now, how the hell do you lose, you know, critical ill patients who are in the focus of Richard, worldwide attention? Don't you normally have critically ill patients in critical care wards? Probably in the, what, what do they call that, uh, the um, no, the critical care facility. Or I if, was in if, one of those. If, if they th yes, you were. <laughs> or when you're very closely watched, monitored, because oh, you're Oh, uh, absolutely. You, you, you can't take, take a wink when people coming in and out, taking your blood, yes. taking your temperature, you know, making sure you're sleeping. And all kinds of stuff like that. And, they, and, and apparently they, quote, could not find where or, these people were or, in the hospital. Or, Richard, or they were taken to a, a place of isolation. Exactly. So now we fast forward the film, as we used to say, and when I, you know, logged on this evening to get my daily dose of what's going on from our sources down there, let me read for you almost word for word what came in this evening from one of my key sources, because this now, this tale is going from abnormal and anomalistic to bizarre. Um, all right, we're not going to have time before the break, okay. so... Um, Would you, I, like a, you don't like that cliffhanger? I guess they've, <laughs> I guess they've got the the doctor out, right? The doctor was extracted. I and love you that term. Extracted, yes. And you, yeah, you think I, that the doctor's uh, removal was more or less a cover for what what else is going on, don't that's you? That's exactly what this email is going to be telling us when we come back from the other side of the break. And the important thing is that it's being reported in New Zealand that the doctor don't want to go. I mean, here's a guy supposedly desperately ill with pancreatitis. He's yep. past gallstones. My yep. grandmother, when we were, you know, we were all, you know, as kids growing up, she had gallstones. And believe me, it's everybody serious. who's ever had a relative with them, it is, it's a nightmare. It's a real serious thing. It's awful. All right, um, understood. Richard, hold, hold it right there. We'll be right back. And sorry for the guests that are getting Adair's description of the alien engine he was allowed to examine at Area 51. You know, I recall him describing a series of tubes that com comprise part of that engine. Sounds a lot like what Deke was describing, doesn't it? Maybe you ought to get David Adair back on your show. And then the other part of it was the touch of the craft itself. Remember what David Adair said about that? Hmm. We'll be right back. Eight hundred two one eight three five two seven. One eight hundred two one eight three five two seven. That's one eight hundred two one eight three five two seven. I'm going to give you a story. I don't have confirmation of it all. Repeat, no confirmation of it. But somebody named Sentry in Kansas City uh, flashes me, fast blasts me, that BBC Radio USA just reported that the International Space Station's main computers are down, some sort of software problem. That's an unconfirmed report, fast blasted to me just now. Uh, once again, Richard C. Hoagland. Richard? Yeah, I heard this morning that they were having problems with the computer uh, manipulating the new Canada arm that was taken up by the current shuttle mission to be attached to the station. Oh? So that could have been a galloping software virus. One never knows. One never knows. Anyway, back to New Zealand. Uh, this just gets squirrelier and squirrelier. Let me read verbatim from the email from one of our sources, and everybody can sort this out for themselves, but um, it, it's going in a very interesting direction. Okay. They say, Yesterday I had a friend in U.S. Intel tell me a few things. I didn't let on what I knew as I wanted them to tell me what they knew. What came back is interesting to say the least. At first, I thought they were talking about the flight that had just taken place. That's the Hercules with the 11 Americans, the first airlift. But now, I know they were talking about the second flight. That's the rescue of the doctor that took place today. Right. I was told that on board the plane, remember, it was a de Havilland Otter which seats eight people, were four to six boxes of Arctic climbing, surveillance, and communications gear and that this had something to do with the lake area, something I hadn't mentioned to them, so they weren't replying to any questions I asked about the lake. They said that the sick doctor was just a cover, 
and that a four-man team was going in with the equipment and will stay the winter in Antarctica. Apparently, one of the team is an Arctic Intel specialist from Nova Scotia, brought in special for Arctic surveillance duty. The inference is that they found something in the lake, as they mentioned that a government UFO specialist of long standing was being transferred as part of the team. God, this is beginning to sound like the thing, Richard. Doesn't it? Yes, it sounds just like the thing. A combination of the thing, 2001, and uh, how many? Uh, well, of course, the X Files movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, God. now let me go to go to her second email uh -oh. um, because this is important. This uh, this now puts a few you know dots on some eyes and some crosses on some T's. Has anybody found the critically ill patients yet? Okay, um, there has been. This is from the email. Haven't heard a word where the other seven are, only the four that are in hospital. The news bulletin that, that I saw tonight showed the flight path of the second plane and they had reached the stopover point before going on to Chile. I did find it really odd that the second Mercy mission wasn't mentioned here whatsoever until after it was all over. The only thing that I had heard before was the doctor now didn't want to be airlifted. So that gives some kind of impression that there might not even be a second flight. It's almost as if they want people to focus on the other one, meaning the one that brought out the 11 Americans yesterday, yes. and not this second one, which, of course, as we know now, did take place. <laughs> it was as if that one and not the other one that carried all the surveillance equipment and the four specialist crew, they probably didn't want much attention on that particular flight. All right, but I go back to these patients. We still actually don't know where these critical patients are? Nope. There has been no further word on if the hospital has how, found how, them. How in God's name can they just disappear? Well, what I'm, gonna, I'm waiting for is, a, is an email from our second source, who is an investigative reporter who has connections with all the mainstream media right. and, and government officials. I mean, all of this was reported, uh, 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 even though it was all mixed up, it was reported relentlessly about these critically ill people. You just don't lose critically ill people. Exactly. You don't lose critically ill people. Unless they are, as, as this source says, a cover to lead people off the trail of the real story, which is the doctor who doesn't want to come home, even though he's, quote, desperately ill. Now, let me, let me read on. I didn't fill you in on this info yesterday about the drop-off or the UFOs. I wanted to see if I could corroborate it from other sources. I never, ever tell them what I want to hear. I let them tell me. Yesterday, I was waiting on the two other contacts to see if the stories matched, and they do. I've also just heard back from two of the same sources, and both have independently told me that the UFO was slash is a dragon snake type. Now, do you know what the hell that means? Uh, no, Richard, I, I don't have any idea. Well, no, no, that's what this person is asking me. I see. I'm sure I've heard that name somewhere before, but I have to do a search to see if I can find a reference, as I can't recall anything specific. They said it drives on the ice and slides right through it. Does that make any sense? That's all I know for now. One of the sources sure as heck didn't want to mention Dragon Snake, but I went on and on, and finally he told me. That also matches what the other one told me, so either they're both lying or they're both right. So we have escalated now to where we're dealing with a possible circular artifact. Now the question, of course, I have, is it, is it present, is it current, or is it ancient? Uh, Do you understand where I'm going well, with Well, of course. Who would yeah. know? Uh, in other words, we are seeing things in our skies now. You just had a man on describing something that crashed 20 years ago. Yes. If we're dealing with a very long-term, how should I say, surveillance program? That would do. And they're not changing models like 57 Chevys? <laughs> then it's conceivable that if you find something buried in the ice in Antarctica, it may be of the same class because it's produced by a civilization that has a totally different time scale and th things do not change. Once you get the physics down and the technology down, you don't change them to put on new tail fins. 
How reliable do you consider this information to be? Well, let me give you now the second, you know, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. Sure. Remember the other night I um, uh, talked to you about a, a source that had just uh, sent me an email from here in the States that's based in the San Diego area. Yes. And said that he had a neighbor who was involved in the shipment of 20-foot crates to Miramar. Right. For the Antarctic. Right. We've got new news on that front. Go. Okay. <laughs> and and this source is a little more volatile, so bear with us. It's, he says, hi, Richard. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like, what's his name on, uh, on um, uh, the guy from Hawaii? Just talk to my neighbor. This could be bigger than you think. Are you ready for this? He is taking equipment, a lot of equipment, 138 truckloads of equipment. Huh. Let me repeat that. 138 truckloads of equipment from Miramar to a place north by Oxnard to a place court called Port Hunami, spelled H-U-E. That, that would be Port Wainimi. Wainimi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Art. They are being loaded onto a container ship that is to ship out at midnight, 426, 2001, to Antarctica. <laughs> he said the pressure is on because they have to finish the loads to the ship by this afternoon. Richard, what are they moving a city of supplies over there for? Thought you'd like to know. Then he followed up a few minutes later with this one. All right? All right. And this one I tried to verify. Well, you'll see how I tried to verify it. And we can't verify it yet, but we are, we're ongoing in that process. I was in such a hurry, I almost forgot the most important thing. The first lady was there today in a White House chopper to do some kind of send-off. I'm thinking better not to mention where this came from, my friend, the neighbor, as I do not want to get him in trouble. Thanks again. The first lady was the there. The first lady. So I called Steve Bassett. And I got him out of bed, and I said, damn it, get to the White House and find out if you can get me the First Lady's itinerary. I did not tell him why I wanted it. didn't tell him where I thought she was. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet he loved that. Oh, he did love that. So he calls me back in about 20 minutes, and he says, you know, they don't publish for security reasons her itinerary. Well, it's 1230 at night, and there's nobody in the damn White House to talk to. <laughs> so we can't verify that she was in California this afternoon. But my friend, who I've also known for like 10 years, and who's not a flighty guy and who was just awed by what he's tripped over because of the serendipity. I mean, he had no idea that I was on to this and we were going to be doing some of these updates. Yes. And he just happens to be next to a guy who's heavily involved. I mean, that's, that's what Jung used to call synchronicities and which we call hyperdimensional resonance. Okay, Richard, uh, let's go over the things we do know. They told the second doctor to bring down salt. Fill your pockets well, Betty with... Betty Carlisle is a replacement doctor for Dr. Fill, Shemansky. Fill your pockets with out. salt uh, on the way down, please. Now, you interpret that now to mean probably um, radiation? Well, one of your emailers said that salt, iodized salt, is a good substitute for iodine tablets yeah. if you are involved in a radiation scenario. You know who else called me today? Linda Moulton Howe called, called me, and she said, you know, fill your pockets with salt would definitely be a code phrase for a radiation problem. Fascinating. Linda we said were that. Told that the in the, she said, quoting, in the nuclear industry, Linda exactly. said. Exactly. Wonderful, Linda. Okay. Because we have a post up tonight with an update with some of this material in it. Yes. And from our sources, we were told the same thing, that it's a code phrase in the industry for basically pop your iodine tablets. So that means they had a radiation problem. Now, where would the radiation come from? Yeah. UFOs do not use nukes. Okay, boys and girls, that's not what they do. They have much more advanced, sophisticated physics and technology. U.S. technology uses nukes. And as I explained on the show last night, since the 1960s, our government, the Atomic Energy Commission, Los Alamos, you know, the big national labs, have been involved in the development of a nuclear boring device, get this art, which could go through solid rock at the rate of six miles per hour. Right, you gave me the patent number for it. Yes, we gave up the patent numbers last night and they're on our website. By the way, I want to credit Richard Souter for doing a lot of this work in his book on underground bases, because he did a tremendous amount of work in digging out the actual documents and now we know their time has come. This right. is where they're going to be basically relevant to the issues at hand. Um, if they had brought a SNAP-100 reactor, 
Are you familiar with that reactor? No. That's the one that the Lewis Research Center, now, Glenn, now renamed the John Glenn Research Center up by Cleveland, had been working on quietly for several years for a manned Mars mission. It was the reactor program that one of the congressmen investigated in the House of Representatives back when Admiral Truly resigned suddenly as the administrator of NASA. Yes. Because... But I, I'm trying here to stick with what we know. No, no, no. This, I mean, snap, this SNAP reactor would be small enough and portable enough to put in a, in a Hercules aircraft and fly to the Antarctic to basically put together as a nuclear subterrain to melt through the ice to get at something underneath. You put all these dots together. We've got the NPR story on the UFO rumor right. in December. We've now got my sources, you know, uh, information that Intel people are telling her that we've got guys going in under the cover of the Take Out the Doctor story to look at a UFO, basically. We've got radiation possible poison people being airlifted in an emergency evac situation to right. Christchurch, right. where they have been lost in a hospital, which that is not that impossible. damn big. No, impossible. And blindly, and no, me, and no statement on their conditions. And not, no statement on not they are so or much as conditions. one word. I assume from either our government, any a, a branch or part of our government, or Raytheon, right? Nope, nothing. When they're asked, what do they say? Apparently, they're saying no comment. They are hiding behind the New Zealand privacy laws, even though these are not New Zealand citizens. They're American citizens. They work for a company which is being paid by U.S. tax dollar money. And a National Science Foundation project at the bottom of the world. Now, let me, let me give you this one. This is the one that kind of puts the icing on the cake for me. Uh, as you know, there were two separate airlifts. There was the New Zealand airlift of the 11 Americans out yesterday. Correct. And then there was the Canadian airlift with the Otters, the Havilland Otter, which is a light aircraft, twin-engine aircraft, uh, today of the doctor supposedly back to, uh, to Chile. That was managed by a company called Ken Borak Air out of Canada. Yesterday, MSNBC ran a story. In fact, it's on the MSNB website, all right, with a quote from the general manager about what they were involved in. And, I mean, this just is going to blow you away, Art. He said, quote, we might as well be on Mars. Well, right. Now, if we're dealing with people finding high technology and a crash program to send, you know, people in to nail down reconnaissance and communications mm -hmm. during the dead of winter down there, yes, and a major container ship following with 138 truckloads of gear, which has to leave tomorrow night at midnight, which is, by the way, one day after my birthday, which was tonight. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you, Art. Sorry, there's so much going on. There is a happy bit birthday. going on. Um... My, my. And uh, so, based on what we know versus uh, w some of your dots are lighter than uh, other dots, uh, right? Agreed. Uh, some of them are very heavy dots, and, and the heavy dots are what we know. The trouble is, connecting them doesn't bring us anywhere. In other words, about the number of people who got sick, then the stories of people coming out, for personal reasons, too. And that one doesn't make any sense to me, frankly. Well, CNN I mean, was reporting two days ago when some reporter asked why the other seven came out in yes. addition to the four that were ill. Right. The spokesperson, this Shreve guy, says, oh, they were homesick. Huh? Oh, please. No, no, no. They had I'm just serious. Be, they had just begun their winter down there. This. These are highly paid contract workers. They, the U.S. government pays a fortune to screen them. Excuse me, but these dots don't connect. To equip them? Yeah, these dots do not connect. To emplace they them? They were homesick. No, no, that's what he said. It, it is on the CNN website from, from two days ago. My source in, uh, one of my sources in New Zealand said that when asked by a New Zealand reporter what was wrong with one of the four, he yeah. was told he had a broken leg. He had a broken leg. A broken leg. Now, and, bear in and, mind... And Anything like this would be cured on the spot. You wouldn't come back. Independent television last night, no. New Zealand time, interviewed one of the four. They found one of the four, all right? Right. And interviewed him in a hospital bed, in that hospital. Yes. He was a fireman, supposedly. Yes. He supposedly had very massive head trauma, except on camera. Head trauma. He had no bandages. He had no bruises, no contusions. He spoke coherently, and he hadn't shaved his head. 
In other words, none of this fits together. So when things don't fit together, it's like, what's wrong with this picture? The most interesting thing to me, Art, is the call for salt. Because as Linda has now corroborated, that says radiation emergency, and there are no nukes by treaty of on course. the entire continent of Antarctica. Right, of course. Since 1993. Yeah, it's international, so. Yeah. International territory. Well, we, do, we used to have a reactor at McMurdo, and, and the Navy took it out because of the environmental concerns of waste products and all that. All right, Richard, how do we get inside this story? Um, how do we do it? Uh, isn't it time the major media began asking the hard questions? Unquestionably, but it's a little difficult because they're half a world away. We pull back all our bureaus because we really don't care about the world anymore. Even CNN does very light world coverage. Um, this is a this is a, this is a problem. All right. Anybody with information bearing on this directly who really knows what's going on, email me, Art Bell at Mindspring dot com, and if it's relevant, I'll get it to Richard. How's that, Richard? I I don't know what else we can do. Well, uh, let me give out our fax number here. All right. Go ahead. Which is five zero five five zero five two eight six two eight six six one three zero six one three Zero. If anybody has relevant information or documents, they can get it to me that way. Okay, 505-286-6130. Yep. All right. Uh, by the way, your PAX TV special, when's that coming up? It's Friday evening, 8 o'clock Eastern and Pacific, 7 Central, 6 o'clock Mountain Time. And it's going to be <laughs> Mars... A la Sidonia, a la Artifacts, as you have never seen it on network television. All right, listen, we're out of time. The rest of the story coming up as it happens. We'll just stay in touch. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Art. Good night. Whew. And I hope I'm doing that uh, justice, his name, that is. Uh, James was raised in a small desert town, spending most of his time in nature. In high school, he was captain of the water polo team, on the swim team and experienced a wide variety of friends of all kinds for he never separated himself uh, into any one group. College, very diverse, uh, studied biology, chemistry, physics, uh, psychology, pre-law, pre-dental, yet didn't acquire a degree or uh, uh, practice professionally. Having diversity was more important uh, than anything else to him, apparently, you know, understanding all aspects of life. His work experience, also very diverse. He learned all facets of the construction industry, grocery industry, real estate industry, owned his own commercial real estate company, which developed and uh, managed shopping centers and other large multi-million dollar projects. He was also on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. He had a near-death experience. And that is a story unto itself. Uh, he's been a speaker at many, many events, has appeared on ABC and Fox News, King 5 Evening uh, News Magazine, Elena Smitha, I believe it is, Daylene Gates, and on and on and on. Oh, he's been all over television. His articles and UFO reports have been featured uh, by Magical Blend. Oh, I know that magazine. And UFO Magazine, I know that one, and our a regular feature by major UFO groups like Cause, Move On, and UFO Roundup, and so forth. So, obviously, a long-time ufologist. Welcome to the program, James. Thank you, Art. It's an so, honor to be on the show. I'm sorry that you're on a little late, about an hour late, actually, uh, but we had two things that uh, unwound, <laughs> had to unwind on the program. One, um, and I just I thought I'd have you comment on these. One was this incredible story of Deke Richards. Mm -hmm. He seemed to have so many details, so many facts, so so many probable witnesses, and it's such an incredible... I mean, it's Roswell in Germany. Oh, yeah. Is that the way it's... How did it... It does sound like that, and the facts do add up, and it'll be interesting when we get a lot more witnesses, if we can get some witnesses, you know, to corroborate his story. That'll be excellent. My... Uh, What's interesting is my family uh, came out of New Mexico, and they knew a lot of the people involved in that Roswell crash. And uh, when I talked to my grandmother about it, she knew the sheriff, and uh, I think it was, was his name Bob Frizzell? Or... That's right, Bob Frizzell. He, yeah, he, uh, my grandfather actually sold him his farm equipment, and oh. uh, a lot oh. of his windmills and, you know, a lot of things of that nature. 
And they speak very highly of everybody involved. They said they were as honest as the day is long, and if they said they saw something, you know, they saw something. And, and they said they were very shaken by the event mm-hmm. when it happened. So, uh, you know, I have no doubt that, that, you know, definitely an event happened there. And okay. That, and, and, and then this other several days long story we're now following uh, with regard to the Antarctic. I don't know how closely you've been following that one, but it's getting weirder by the minute. There's a lot of anomalies there. There's, uh, it, it's almost sound like the uh, Bermuda Triangle, the same kind of uh, magnetic fluctuations there. And yes. They may end up digging up a, a buried pyramid, you know, with an activated crystal in it and, and uh, something of that nature. You never know what they're going to find. Yeah, it could be. It could be anything. But the radiation I, I, isn't making sense. It sounds like something got away from them. There, yeah, and I don't know how you lose critical patients either. No, no, it's it's pretty interesting. You have you know, to really work at that. Yeah, they, you know, another thing too, when you get these huge, massive uh, solar flares and CMEs, those energies come zinging in right at the poles. Right. And so these people could be getting fried by uh, just just there's just way too much energy and uh, magnetic fluctuation. You know, it's interesting that you would mention that. By the way, I'm getting confirmation that all three uh, main computers on the International Space Station have failed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to follow that story as it comes in. But I've got a story here which ran in the Wall Street Journal. And this has not been, I, I guess, you're sure, they're the mainstream press, but I had never heard about it until I got this Wall Street Journal copy of the story. And... What it basically says is that airlines like, for example, Northwest, which regularly flies over the pole on routes from Detroit to Beijing and Shanghai, they recently began doing these flights. They've all decided to stay uh, stay south of the pole and did so for about two weeks. United Airlines, with its Hong Kong to New York route, also avoided the established flight path closest to the pole on a few flights by taking another nearby route. Continental twice bypassed the pole on its Hong Kong flight, all of this because of solar flares. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what they told the passengers. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, these, you know, there's been some research, too, done at Stanford where they subjected monkeys to fluctuations in, in the magnetic field and uh, very large fluctuations, and they exhibited behavior, everything from comatose to self mutilation. Really? So, uh, Gee, we're all kind of monkeys. <laughs> exactly. Sort of, kind of. And so, you know, it's not... Uh, these these flares and CMEs, they hit the bioelectric fields around the human body. There's Russian research around this, too, where it uh, people have emotional outbursts. They start projecting and processing a lot of old wounds and traumas. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's what you refer to as the quickening. Everything's coming up. Well, I'll say. All right. I watched your videotape tonight, James. Great. (laughs) So I saw what you're about to describe. Uh, Fortunately for James, he had not one, uh, I think, uh, video camcorder, but probably two, because I kept hearing people saying, are you getting this? Are you getting this? Uh, Did you have one out there or two? We had, actually, on the two landings we had, we had one. Landings, yeah, we have landings. So hold on, folks. We're getting ahead of our story here. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're talking about, first of all, what period of time? Represented on the videotape, what period of time? Many days, I would assume. Is Well, we've got uh, from, we started filming these objects last May. And uh, I was telling people about all the UFO activity here, and nobody was believing me. All right, now we get to the here part. Where is here? Where are you talking Okay, about? we're in Trout Lake, Washington, right at the base of Mount Adams. Okay. And Mount Adams has, or the Yakima Reservation, which is my, I look straight out across the reservation. Our ranch is right next to the reservation. Uh-huh. It has a very long history of UFO activity and sightings. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, uh Bill Vogel and uh, Greg Long, David Akers, have all done a lot of research here. And their res- uh, their findings actually came out, uh, they've been out for some time now, actually a couple of them have died. About sightings near uh, Mount Adams? Yes, uh-huh. the Trump, they would Trump be Trump. on the uh, east side of Mount Adams is uh-huh. where they were seeing these. And uh, 
It's all well documented on our website at, at eSETI.org. All right, uh, what is eSETI? Now, eSETI is, what it stands for is Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrials. Sounds like C-SETI, only E-SETI. Very similar. The only thing is, is we've taken a step further, and we've actually made contact, and uh, we've had some very interesting things where uh, we've got probably over 700 eyewitnesses now that have come here and seen the craft fly over and light up on command. We would, You know, I, I must say... If I hadn't seen it, uh, that is the video, I, I, I would think you're crackers right now. <laughs> but, but, folks, I saw these extremely bright objects moving as no satellite could, as no airplane could, in some cases, accelerating instantly uh, to incredible speeds. I saw one of them land on the damn mountain. <laughs> and I, I'm talking about Mount Adams. All of this was quite visible on the videotape. However, at no point did it become more than an extremely, at least to the video camera, an extremely bright light moving in ways that aircraft couldn't move. Mm -hmm. That's how far I can go from what I saw on the videotape. Exactly. We've had some of this analyzed. We have, uh, I have another tape, actually, it's on its way to you with even more footage. Well, James, as you were describing one of the objects, and you would call for it to brighten, and by God, it would brighten. And there were several witnesses there, not just you. That was the other impressive part of, about it. Uh, the object did, in fact, brighten. How sure are you that object was responding to your request to brighten? Well, we've got 11 hours now of video footage of them flying over doing the same behavior. And after a while, when it's repeated again and again and again, it... Uh, you know, it's real funny. We just yell, like, the whole group goes, light it up, light it up, and, and it'll get right over the ranch here, and then it just lights right up. Lights up. Uh, what kind of video camera were you using? I've got a small Sony. It's probably the cheapest model you can get. Um, I, I well, it did very well because it even caught some of the background stars, and that, that made it easy in some cases to get a reference for how this object was moving. Exactly. If we, we, we really, uh, we're on a shoestring budget here. Basically, we've got one Sony camcorder and two, uh, VCRs. Is how we put all this together. I see. We're not like NASA or SETI, but, <laughs> you know, we've delivered, actually. We've delivered the witnesses. We've had astrophysicists up here, scientists and aeronautic engineers. We've even had Air Force design in engineers come out. And look at these ships flying over, and they said, those aren't ours. We well, aren't, I noticed that at are. one point when you were um, filming one of the objects, it was particularly bright. You said, I'm watching it with one eye through the viewfinder, mm -hmm. and my other eye is seeing more than the camera is seeing. You were, you were saying it was a gold color, and were you able to discern shape? Well, that particular object, it morphed into as many as four balls, but... In, in the naked eye, it was gold color, and it kept expanding out, and it would morph into four, like a li long wing with four lights on it. But the the camcorder could only pick up one light, unfortunately. It's, if, we just, if we had a, a real nice digital camera or something of that nature, we could probably pick up a lot more detail. All right. Um, tell me what's available to be seen on your website. On our website, we have... Just a load of information there. We have all kinds of photos that have been taken by UFO investigators and guests. The photos were all taken by other people, and there was a reason for that. And I and uh, and this is this extends this out further. But in telepathic contact that I've had for quite a while with these beings, they told me they didn't want me to try to prove that these pictures are real. So it leaves me out of the loop. I don't have to prove it because I have the people that took the pictures and their testimony to back up the events. But All right, for some reason, uh, I'm being taken. Let me be sure I'm in the right place here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm being taken to something called Self Mastery Earth Institute. Yeah, well, we'll click on uh, the UFO where it says photos. Uh, UFOs and full contact photos and video clips. Photos All right, and video clips. Photos clips and video clips. All right, I see it. I'm on my way. Okay, then you'll you'll start coming up with the photos. All right, and the video clips there, and we've got some clips of the uh, landings. Of there was actually two landings, and we've got uh, all kinds of photos of flyovers and and uh, things of that nature. 
Well, the, the uh, I'll say this. The, uh, gosh, the, the video itself was incredibly, just incredibly impressive. Uh, those were not any sort of terrestrial aircraft, that's for certain, and they weren't satellites. So what, what's left? Exactly. Well, you know, that, that one was taken uh, 12 miles away, the landing, because the mountain is, is about 12 miles away from us. So the sheer candle power that that object was putting out and, and the, the size of it is immense. And it came over the very top of the mountain, and, and this is almost, you know, a 13,000-foot mountain, came over the top and started descending down and uh, descended over some sheer cliffs and rock faces. And, uh, you know, it would be impossible for any kind of conventional vehicle to do anything like that. And uh, people that have looked at the tape, they said the sheer candle power, there was no way you could get anything up there mobile with that much candle power. I, I absolutely agree with you. And they, they changed intensity. Sometimes they would pulse. Sometimes they would simply get extremely bright and stay that way. Uh, they went through all sorts of changes, right? Well, they, they would actually morph. It would send a smaller light out, and then that one would get as big as the original light. I saw, I saw that happen, as a matter of fact. And it would morph into as many as three, and one, it actually goes into four, but four different objects, and then back to one again. So they can actually bilocate or duplicate their ship. It's, it's, uh, phenomenal what these, the technology these beings have, and, and, uh, so what, what we're looking at is definitely nothing you know, that we have. Okay, your page is slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> we should be able to take a million and a half hits, according to my my webmaster, but I uh, mean my uh, server. Yes. Well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of slow right now. Um, you know, I've got the sound of a UFO. You You actually recorded the sound of a UFO, didn't you? Yes, yes, we did. Now, this, this actual recording was recorded by a very good friend of mine named Choi. You know what, though? I don't have it. Oh, you didn't get it? No, I don't think that I've yet received it. Um, I will consult my chief helper in the other room, my lovely wife, Ramona. All right. Uh, you sent it on a CD? No, actually, um, I think it was... Uh... Oh, you, 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 I believe you, I, I remember what it was. Delana, is it Delana? No, Delani at the network. Del, Delani, yeah, Delani was actually shooting that over to you somehow. Okay. However she did that, I don't know. I don't think that it made it today. Today would have been the day when it would have arrived, I All think. Right. And so if we don't have it, we're going to have to play it for somebody tomorrow. Do you have a recording of that there? No, I have it on the website, actually where it says, here, the sound of a UFO. I know. I've been clicked on that now for about uh, a <laughs> minute and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, we're challenging your website right now, uh -huh. I'm afraid. All right. Uh, you know what? I've got it. Bless your heart, honey. Thank you. My wife just brought it to me. It okay. did arrive. It hadn't even been opened yet. I'm going <laughs> to open it up right now. Voila, a CD. So after we come back from, uh, it's a 36. Six second clip, and after we come back from the break, I'll be able to play this for everybody. So they did get it here. All right. How about that? Um, how do you think, and why do you think that you and your friends, and you've got a witness there who's going to get on the phone when we want them to, exactly, have been blessed where you are with such frequent and incredible contact? Any thoughts on that? Yes, it's what's happened is we've risen to the occasion, and uh, there's some very strong protocols when you're dealing with these beings because they're very advanced beings, and they're also very spiritually advanced as well. How do you know that? Because I've seen them face to face. That's a good answer. <laughs> You've seen the beings face to face. Yes, uh huh. We've had we've had full blown contact here. It's been going on for about eight years, but we haven't been able to get it out or get anybody to listen to us. So we just kept documenting the evidence over and over and over. Well, your video documentation is excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, We've got many, more. <laughs> how, many, how many people have copies of this tape? Um, that particular tape has been shot out to probably about 40 or 50 people. So like, 40 or 50 have seen this. Exactly. And what kind of comments do you get other than the ones I gave you? 
Well, even skeptics walk away just scratching their head, and one woman watched it, and she went into process, started kind of really flipping out, just could not handle it. It Because uh, she was in denial and real skeptic, and after seeing this... Well, look, footage, a couple of the clips are like something out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, not quite that close, but I mean when these lights, these bright orbs just suddenly split and take off. Mm-hmm. Well, we have these giant golden ones that come in, and they come right at you. Okay, now we and were unable. Out. We could not discern the golden color no. on the tape. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I that, that's what those. I remember you said. I, no, I remember you said I'm seeing it just as a bright light in the viewfinder, but with my left eye, yes, I can see it's gold colored. Yeah, that was a higher one. That the ones there's been so much activity here. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get it all on film. Uh, you've got enough though. Hold on, if you would please. James Gilliland is my guest. He is a ufologist up in Washington State, which seems to be... James, welcome back. I've got good news and medium news. <laughs> the good news is one person I see out of ten here that I've got on my screen right now did get through, watched, he says, a 31 meg uh, MPEG file, and he says, wowzers, that's <laughs> Dick in Cottage Grove, Oregon. So he saw some video. Okay. Most of the other people, though, are saying things like, the site is slow, it's not just you, I'm on cable. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, let's see, a sound is downloading now, but at about 50 bytes a second, I may hear it next week if I'm <laughs> lucky. So that gives you some idea of what's happening to your website right now. Well, we, we know that a million and a half of your listeners have computers, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right, uh, so they're trying to get to what they can get to. All right, so I've got this... CD, and by the way, it looks like it has, uh, I'm, I'm trying to determine how many tracks are actually on, I guess just one. Mm-hmm. All right, it, it, it describe to me where you were when you recorded this and the circumstances around wh- whatever's on here. Okay, this particular uh, sound was recorded actually by a friend of mine by the name of Choi, who was very involved with us here, and uh, he was a student at Portland State University. And he came up here and made telepathic contact with them. And he was a, a kung fu master, chikung master, totally fearless, um, very tapped in, studied at all the Eastern schools. And when he made contact with these beings, he sat there and cried for half an hour. And he said, this is the strongest energy he's ever felt, in, you know, anywhere. And uh, his first meeting with them when they came in and flew over real low, um, he had a $7,000 video camera with him, and it just sat there hanging at his side. And and I told him, I said, you think you're ready, but you're not ready yet. And he Along kept... with his mouth uh, on, on his, his chin <laughs> on his chest, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. His mouth was wide open, yeah. and he was just two feet planted and, and almost in shock. I understand that. And, and I told him, I said, well, this is your first one. And so, you know, I said, you're just getting primed, you know, for when they really come in. So then what? He had it running but not pointed well no what he did was uh they told him there's two videos that he took for us and one is on the on the uh the other uh, video that i'm sending you that we have available on our site um and he took one out of a plane window where they said they were going to fly next to the plane and he shot that and they did they flew right next to a commercial plane he shot it out the window and he got (laughs) he got this on videotape yeah, it's out, of, all out of a commercial airline. Exactly, and this ship flies right along uh, next uh, to the uh, plane, uh, uh, and it starts shape shifting, which is the weirdest thing, and it turns into a, a large pillar, like a pillar of light, straight up and down. Yes. And then it turns into an arrowhead, and then it turns into a hand held exactly like the Hebrew symbol for God, and. Uh, which is phenomenal. And I think I saw an outer limits just like this, except in that <laughs> I, this, this little being was, might have been Twilight Zone, I don't know, where this little being was pounding on the airliner's window, <laughs> and it was terrifying. This isn't quite that bad, but no. was anybody else, pray tell, besides your friend seeing this, you know, like the other passengers, the stewardess, the... Yeah, his, uh, the person next to him was seeing it, pilot. and... He was, he was really afraid, and he didn't tell anybody because he thought they might steal his tape. And so he didn't tell anybody else or try to verify it. But he got the tape. Exactly. And we actually have copies of that, and that's all. It's been out, analyzed by okay. a 
Jim Delatos with Village Labs and right. several other people, and they said it's, it, there's no evidence whatsoever of a hoax. It's All right. Real. All right, come back now to the sound that I'm going now, to play. Now, the second the thing he filmed was right outside of his window at Portland State University, they brought a mothership in, a great big one, and he sat there and filmed it. Now, the film only shows a light in the sky, a very large light. Right. But the light actually corresponds with the sound. And when the sound starts uh, pulsing faster, the light pulses faster. It's, it, and so it ties it in with the ship. And uh, the sound, too, has some very interesting characteristics to it because when people hear it, it seems to alter them in some way, in a very good way. But it triggers either old memories or something. People really? Just love hearing this. They do this sound. So. I've never heard it. Now, uh, so he recorded this. Uh, the only thing on video was a very bright light, but um, obviously the camera was rolling. Now, did anybody utter any language during this that I can't play on the air? No, no. And actually, what we did is we had to take out the background noise because actually. He was listening to you in the background interviewing Linda Moulton Howe. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> no. We get around. No, but it was pretty funny. So we had to take that <laughs> out to boost <laughs> up the sound. <laughs> All right. Uh, how far above him was this when he taped this? Um, it's, I would say probably a couple thousand feet. A couple thousand feet. You know, just, just a guesstimate. And he had invited this thing to arrive. Exactly. What What happened was... He would go into meditation. We showed him how to connect with them, and that's why we call it enlightened contact with extraterrestrials because we have a technique that we can show people actually how to connect in, with these beings. They're, okay, then really your work is very much like C. Setti's, Dr. Greer, isn't it? Very much. It's very similar. Dr. Greer also feels that he can um, uh, communicate with these beings and cause contact. And they've, exactly. They've got quite a few records of it. All right, I'm going to play this sound. I'm dying to hear it, so let's play the sound, and we'll be right back. Here it is, whatever it is. Holy smokes! <laughs> you, you're saying that it was delivering that sound from 2,000 feet up? Exactly, right to the camcorder. They, they have. I'd have lost my lunch. Yeah. That's, uh, that's some sound. What do you think we're hearing? We're hearing obviously the drive system, I guess, of what? some kind of craft, or what? Well, actually. Um... I'll tell you, uh, another mind blower is that sound, when I listen to uh, the Elfrad site and the Kent Stedman, both have a sound of a pulse coming from the center of the, ga the galaxy. Yes. And they added the golden mean to it, and they put it together on a tape, and when you clicked on it, it sounded almost identical to that craft. Uh, one more time, very uh, short version. Not exactly steady. You, you hear it hiccup a little. There, for example. Oh, that's weird stuff, James. <laughs> it it kind of uh, stutter steps a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, that might be in the reproduction of it because we had to do some work on it to take out the background noise. Is that basically an accurate rendition otherwise, though, yes, of that yes, sound? It's, it's very accurate. We just removed some of the background noise. Like my show on the radio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd lose it. If, uh, if there was an object above me making that sound uh, with a very bright light, I don't think I could, I could really hold it together. But then again, he was new, I guess, at this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of an old hand at this by now. Yes, uh-huh. So I think you'd probably keep your camera in the right. In fact, I must say, you were doing an incredible job 
on the video, folks, you could see, it, even though it was nighttime, it was clear enough, or there was enough light, or the camera was good enough, you could see Mount Adams quite clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, when you were zoomed in, although it's a long zoom, you could see the trees, uh, you could see the, uh, the rocks above the tree line, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. on Mount Adams. And, the, and, and when one landed, it kind of landed and moved around on the mountain for quite a period of time, didn't it? Yes, yeah, we had... We had two landings. One lasted about 45 minutes, and the other one lasted probably about an hour and 15 minutes. And you tracked these on the ground as best you could as they moved all around the mountain, from the tree line up in to above the tree line and then down even toward the base of the mountain, right? Exactly. One so came actually over the top of the mountain, which, is, which would be impossible for any kind of a vehicle. And that's also a wilderness area. There are no vehicles allowed, not even a helicopter. No motorized vehicles can go up there. And the only way you could go up there if it was a life and death, like a rescue, and you have to have a note from the governor and the head of the wilderness department here. Okay. Um, just for the record, uh, if you wouldn't mind, ask Paul to either get on the phone or pick up a phone. He's uh, another witness who was with you during all of this, right? Yes, he's listening in right now, and he should have the phone right next to him. All right, Paul, turn your radio off and pick up your telephone. That information will get to him in about uh, six seconds. Okay. <laughs> about now. <laughs> okay, yes, I'm here, Art. Yeah, hi, Paul. <laughs> uh, I, I take it you're listening to, uh, to a radio in a different room. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm actually in our other house, what we call our guest house, where people that come to... I watch and enjoy the craft uh, stay. How long have you known James? Uh, three years. Three years? Yes. And were, uh, the, you know the videotape I saw, right? Oh, yes, uh, yes. I was out there watching it. This all right. The you clay. were there during all of this? Yes. Uh, your observations, please. Um, and we're, we're talking about the last landing here. I, I, I beg your pardon? You broke Are off. we referring to the, the last most recent landing? Um, well... The, the times that you saw the objects uh, near Mount Adams, around Mount Adams, uh, above Mount Adams, the objects that traveled sometimes moving in, in impossible ways, sometimes accelerating in impossible ways, obviously not satellites, those objects, those whatever they were. Okay. Well, basically, these are, from what I can see, the same craft that we view overhead all the time that we videotape that... Uh, make these impossible right angle turns that uh, uh, they light up on request, as James was mentioning earlier. Um, we we saw something kind of funny just last night when uh, two of these craft were flying over and a air, commercial airplane was <laughs> coming towards them, and one of them made a real quick like oh uh, a right angle turn like a, a zip. Who knows how many thousands of miles per hour to move out of the way at the last second. And we know that. We were just laughing. We are going, we know that pot, it must have just been blown away. And, of course, we'd love it if that pot it would call into your program. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was 11 o'clock. <laughs> we shouldn't yeah. hold our breath on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but anyhow... Uh, Is there any way the pilot could have missed it? No. no. They, they, they waited until the last minute to get something veer out of the way. I know it's difficult to judge with altitudes, but how seemingly close to the uh, airliner did he come? It looked like within a, a thousand feet. I mean, uh, as far as height, you know, within a, I'd say a thousand, two thousand feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were. You couldn't say that they were in direct line of each other, but surely within his view. Um, as in, you know, I wouldn't say they were going to collide, but surely he could see this big orb just hovering there, uh, right in front of him. You know, it was, it was quite close. But I don't think there was ever a real danger of a collision. It was more like just like a, a contact where they come in and. Uh, hover there for a minute and say hi, then move out of the way so the pilot doesn't panic. Uh, Paul, how close has your contact been? James uh, has had full contact, has met with these beings, which we're yes. going to get to yet. How about you? How how, how much contact have you experienced? Um, the same, but with a uh, with different group of beings, actually. Um, but, really? again, working for the same cause... Um, I, I wouldn't say it was exactly the same. It was more, um, our, our, my situation was more a one where we were out in a vehicle and uh, kind of contacted by a craft that, that came in and basically picked up the vehicle. <laughs> so that was uh, a different group, but yet 
um, associated with what's going on here. Uh, they're definitely connected. You know, they're all working together. How um, many uh, are typically, for example, on a on a cold night uh, up there near Mount Adams? How many of you are there that witness these incredible things? Well, it, you know, this depends again if it's a weekend and if if people are coming up. You know, during this time of year when it warms up and when we can get the word out, a lot of people will come up and. You know, sometimes there's as many as 20 people outside there uh, around the campfire, basically the way we set it up. And well, it's a campfire that faces north towards the mountain, which right. is where the activity is primarily occurring in that direction. And so I would say, you know, it could be just me and James, or it could be as many as 20 or 30 of us out there even. It did, really did you, 20 or 30. Did you see, and I should really say the same thing to Dr. Greer sometime, did you, did you see uh, uh, Independence Day? The both of you? Oh, yeah. Yes. You uh, did. Do you remember the group on top of the building <laughs> that was uh, waving and screaming and yelling and UFO land here, uh, ooh, land yes. here, you know, yeah. come save Earth, all the rest of it, they held up signs. And as I recall, they were the first group that were destroyed <laughs> by the Independence Day craft, right? <laughs> now, ha have you ever, as a group, wondered about that? I mean, after all, you are inviting things in about which you don't know a great deal, or at least certainly didn't in the beginning, and still may not. Mm -hmm. You want to take that one, James? <laughs> I, I think our biggest threat isn't coming from the ETs. It's coming from our own people, our own government. We just had a, a warthog fly in here. Um, it said U.S. Marine Corps. Actually, Paul saw it better than I did. He could tell you about it. <laughs> Yeah, they gave us a low flyover this morning about, oh, I think it was about 11 a.m. Yeah, we get those here, too. Yeah, and, you know, those Warthog bombers, I believe they're called Warthogs. The yeah. We use in the Gulf War, the yeah. low-level bombers. Yeah, that's right. They go after tanks. Yeah. And, yes, and they flipped up and showed us the underside to let us know they were loaded with bombs. Uh, just as they went over our, at treetop level. Oh, that's right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a little bit of a message. <laughs> but, you know, Black Helicopter was here last week trying to do the same thing, and we just, we don't worry about it. I have them on film, actually. Yeah, we but filmed that one. You have not yet answered my question. In other words, <laughs> in other words, inviting these things in as you are, uh, isn't there the slightest concern that y you might not be inviting something that will be happy with you when it gets there? <laughs> I personally, um, I've experienced them firsthand, so. I don't have a problem with that, and I also know these other ones are looking after me. The best so no, no negative experiences. It's an energy thing, Art. You know, when they, when you're connecting with a ship, even, and when they light up, um, there's a pulse of energy that comes down that literally tingles your whole body, and just it creates an excitement that I can only explain as uh, like a, like you'd see a child uh, with a new toy um, ride his bike for the first time, uh, a six-year-old kid or whatever. The, the level of excitement that goes through you and just the, the, the rush of real positive energy is just incredible. Um, and then the one that James uh, filmed here about, well, I guess it was about two weeks ago now, mm -hmm. you can even see these pulses of this energy coming off of it, and they're hitting me directly, and I'm outside building a campfire. You know, if you didn't have so photographs, giddy. you know, if you didn't have photographs and video and sound, people would think you're crazy as a loon. Yes, they exactly. probably would. <laughs> or, sorry, loons. Uh, all right, we gentlemen, had... hold on, hold on. Yes. Instead of bumper music, uh, let us go to the break with this. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM from the High Desert. You're listening. Back down to James Gilliland. Uh, James, are you there? Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, somebody asks, uh, past lasts, uh, do they say anything about the concept of death? Um, they do, actually. Really? What? Um, basically, they they live much longer than we do. They live you know, around 800 years or so. So the one that I connected with was around 400 years old and looked like she was about you know, 29 or so. But uh, H G H plus exactly oh. plus 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 yeah. you know but uh, they um, to them it's uh, uh, the wheel basically that that nothing ever dies and that your body although it lays down it just disassembles itself back into the you know the elements 
and that the life force is actually in the atom itself, and then the spirit goes on. So, so everything is in a constant um, renewal, you might say. It's just transforming. Yep. But uh, they said that that nothing, you know, as a as a soul, you go on and on and on, and and it's real important too, is what they said. There's a lot of us here on Earth that are more from the stars in our soul than we are from Earth. Our souls have come here and picked up a body from these other places. So, And a lot of these people are being activated right now. My second contact, that's what that entailed, was uh, a beam of light came right through the wall and hit me square in the chest, and it actually left a burn mark on my chest. And the next thing you know, I was standing aboard the ship, and it was more of a plasma ship. This one, it was more of a spiritual experience. But it left a burn mark on my chest to prove that this was a real event. You know that a lot of uh, religious conservatives would say, you fool, don't you realize that what you're encountering isn't from anywhere else, any other star system. What you're encountering is the devil, demonic forces. Mm -hmm. And to that you would say what? Well, I've heard it all. but uh, Well, I know, but I thought you might yeah. want to hear it one more time. Yeah, basically, um, to me, I look at the vibration of the experience, and if there's love and joy and service involved in it, um, I don't see how it can, can go wrong. And there's uh, just the sheer energy, because I was trained extensively, extensively in dealing with um, discarnate spirits and things of that, that level in my yoga and llama training and things like that. So I do know how to heal and move those kind of energies on. So you think you can separate the two and you know you're not dealing with that? Exactly. I, I don't have any doubts at all. You're not denying the presence of that or the possible presence of that, but you're saying that's not what this is. No, this isn't what this is. And, and, uh, I tell you what's interesting is this is mentioned throughout the Bible. It's mentioned throughout almost every sacred text. Uh, J.J. Hertak and the Keys of Enoch talks a lot about these kinds of contacts that are happening right here. And as a matter of fact, I spoke at a conference with him, and he came up after I spoke, and he said, you know, thank me very much for the, for the talk and, and all the photos and everything we had. And he said, what's happening at your ranch is what he's written about. But he said it's happening a little faster than he expected. Yeah. But, um, do you have uh, videos or tapes available for people who don't have Internet? Yeah, we do, and the video is so much better than what's on the Internet. It's, it comes out much clearer, and we're working on that now. We're getting some live uh, video streaming and things of that nature. We, as again, I said, we're very underfunded. We don't have any funding, basically, and, and uh, we don't have the equipment to really get this information out like it needs. Well, let me help you fund. Uh, how much do you charge for the tapes? The tapes, um, we have one for uh, 1499 and that covers all of the TV shows I've been on. It has the photos in it. It has the, the uh, plane episode where it flies next to the jet and shapes ships, and it has a lot of other uh, contacts that are happening with kids. What about everything. some of what you sent uh, me? Yes, a lot of that's on those tapes. The only okay. thing that's not on it is the landings, the last two landings. That was so new. Yeah, that's still new. But All right, it's $14.99. Um, how would people get that to you? Now, they can they can either send a check or money order to the Self Mastery Earth Institute, and that's Self, you. Uh, hold it. Self Mastery Earth Institute. Yeah, or just S-M-E-I. Or S-M-E-I would be easier. All right. And P.O. Box 281, Hood River, Oregon, and it's 97031. I'm sorry, I'm slow here. Uh, the zip code again, please. 97031. Okay. Uh, SMEI, P.O. Box 281, Hood River, Oregon. Zip code 97031. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, from the time they send you a check or money order, whatever, how long will it be before they get their tape? Uh, we can send them right out. We're, we're getting low on stock. These are kind of flying out the door. Um, I'm working with um, Fifth Smith with uh, Spiral Into It. Actually, I'm going to be on May 1st. I'm going to be on his his program where he has another video that he made of, of an interview with me. And he's got a 1-800 number for that one if people want to call that number to get to get that tape where he has a lot of this footage as well. 
it's a different tape, but uh, it's 1-800-662-1877. Okay. one 800 662-1877, but that's a different uh, interview. Yeah, it's another interview, and it has a lot of the same footage. And what we're getting we're getting ready to do is we're going to add the landings and a couple other just phenomenal shots to the first video, and that should be available in two weeks. In two weeks. All right. Uh, everybody, bear that in mind. On the international line, uh, you're on the air with James Gilliland. Hi. Hi, this is Aaron from Darwin in Australia. Yes, sir. I have a question for your guests this morning about MIBs. Basically, I'm curious to know, firstly, if they really do exist, and if they do, what's their agenda? All right, men in black is what he's saying. All right. Uh, or do, they, do they really exist, and if they do, what are they all about? Um, I'll tell you my own experiences here is we, we do have black helicopters uh, flying around here, and they do appear right after an incident might happen, like the landings, they came right after that happened. And they're very aware of what's going on. And we've actually filmed them, and they're in the, they're in the videos. We've, 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 uh, I just grab a camera and walk out there and start filming them. And they do have some strange hardware that I've never seen before and nobody else can identify. Um, we've had them fly very low here around the house, videotape the entire place here and then drop down to, to about a couple feet off the ground. And they were so close that I actually saw a mole on the pilot's face. I, I was looking face-to-face -face with them, and they have not one mark on that, on that copter. You know, the way it's going, uh, if, if you're, uh, you're on a ranch? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Your ranch isn't nothing more than a burn spot soon. You're going to be <laughs> lucky. All right. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with James. Hi. Hi, James. This is Douglas from San Angelo, Texas. Hello, Douglas. And it's great to speak with you. Um, I, I have a question. You said something earlier about uh, them, your co contacts that you've had. They might be you know, ancestors or brothers or sisters from a past calamity in Earth's past, maybe? Yes. Um, now, the past two or three years, I've been having visions, dreams about different, different sendings. And the only way that I've been able to interpret these is by doing writing. And mm -hmm. uh, when I do the writing, it just it comes out. Sometimes I feel like I'm not even the one doing the writing. Yeah, they call it automatic writing. That's right. And yeah. Here it flows through you, and you write down the transmission. And it, but it's coming out as sometimes it comes out. You know, as things I have to put together later to interpret it, or and, but mostly it's coming out as a story. Yeah. And I just was wondering if you think that this might, they're attempting some kind of reintegration or with us, like that we're, you know, that we're, they're, that we're the same race that's just developed differently from them, like they escaped the calamity or? Yes. Yeah. Are, are we separately created uh, creatures or are we of common ancestry? We're common ancestry and common genetics. Um, they, they are what, I'll tell you what happened um, a long time ago in, you know, the, the myths that aren't really myths about Atlantis and Lemuria, those were originally Palladian colonies, and they actually attracted a lot of beings from other nations, and they, they all lived together harmoniously, but then things got out of hand and technology got out of hand, and they started warring on each other, and, and they, they pretty much did themselves in and almost did the planet in. But we've had several. Uh, we're going into the fifth world right now. This isn't uh, the first civilization, you know, that's been here, and that's why they're finding all these pyramids and and temples that we can't duplicate today because uh, those are some of the buildings of the, you know, the ancient ancestors, and the very ancient ones are being recycled, you know, as molten rock because the earth is always bending inward and and. Uh, recycling itself. All right, Corey in Austin, Texas, practical question. What is their life source? What do they consume? Um, as far as I understand, they eat a lot of uh, things just like we do, and a lot of our our plant and animal kingdom actually was brought here, and so they their, their environment is much like ours. Um, I haven't gotten that much into their diet, you know, but... Uh, Are they meat eaters? Do you know... Um, I've heard that some do and some don't. I think most of them are probably uh, more, like more vegetarian. 
but I think they do have some form of uh, protein that they that they get from from an animal. Good, because if it keeps up the way it is, we'll have to borrow a hamburger from them soon. <laughs> exactly. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with James Gilliland. Hi. That'd be like mad alien disease, like mad cow or something. I don't. Well, know. once it's widespread down here, then what price a hamburger, huh? <laughs> or chicken? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Miss Lear Jet Tim from Cool Lake, Alberta. Yes, sir. Um, hey, can I answer that question? Said, why do our scientists need guarding in Antarctica? Uh, sure, you can, you can it, try and it, answer it. I have a question, but this is like, could it be something similar to the movie Ice Station Zebra? Uh, yes, of course it could. It uh, could be right. similar to the thing, too. Who, who the hell knows? <laughs> I, I have no idea what's going on down there, but we're going to find out you somehow. Know, you know, the, uh, the Russians are supposed to be there, too, aren't they? Oh, yes. And so we've got several... Yes, with a big magnetic anomaly and a lake and, oh, li listen, it could be... Uh, I'm surprised nobody's seen James Arness floating across the ice yet. <laughs> uh -huh. The yep. way it's going. I right, anyway, a... do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, you know what? Something happened tonight that was uh, scared scared the the Jesus out of me. I guess you could say on the air. Uh -huh. um, I got a ride home tonight by uh, the guy whose name was Jeff. He's a cab driver here in town. Yes. And uh, I've got a law enforcement background. Uh, and, you know, the first time in my life, I wasn't sure whether I was being interviewed or interrogated. And I think that maybe, maybe I've fallen, I've called too many times on the wild card line, Art, but, uh, I got a bit of a scare tonight. So I don't know what's going well, on. I hope you didn't leave my tip then. Anyway, do you uh, have a Not at all. But my question is this. Yes. Um, I've read some documents in the past, James. Mm hmm. And have you ever heard anything about devices, um, let me explain what they look like. Um, a German stick grenade from the Second World War, but very miniature. You, you know what I'm talking about? You mean like the swastika? No, a stick grenade. Like it's a wooden handle with a, a, a knob at the top. It's a uh, grenade, not like ours. Ours are handheld. Oh, okay. German ones oh, stick stick. grenade. Okay. Yes, okay. Stick grenade. Yeah. But they're they're smaller, and at the top there's two rings, and they're magnetic, and they're placed. Uh, on highways or roads, and they attach themselves themselves to vehicles uh, that are tagged or not or are random, mm -hmm. and they're used for tracking by the people you're talking about by by aliens. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're, uh, they're they're set up on roads to. Uh, well, I have never heard of such a thing, uh, James. No. Have you? No, I haven't. And I know the ones that we're dealing with don't have any problem tracking you at all. They don't even need a device. That's how I would think it would be. Yeah, they're so advanced. They they can just, like, pretty much think about you and know where you are. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with James. Hi. Hi, Art. It's uh, Glenn from South Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, two questions for James and a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, have they uh, run that sound through an oscilloscope? And uh, uh, if they've seen any uh, higher or lower frequencies, because there seem to be some kind of pattern. Yeah, they have, and the person to talk to on that would be Jim Delatosa of Village Labs. Uh huh. And, and I, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll get you his contact information, and he did all the analysis on it, and he said it had all kinds of anomalies in it. You have an email address? Uh, no, I don't. No, not, not you, caller. <laughs> oh, yes, uh huh. Uh, you said, uh, James, you said send an email. Yeah. Uh, we you haven't can... given out any email address. Okay, so. yeah, you can send one um, just. You know, click on the site eSETI. dot org. Yeah, but that might not be so easy right now. So yeah, or you can send it to James at Kazekiel at C A Z E K. Wait a minute, wait a minute. James at start again. C A Z E K I E L. dot o r g. dot org. Pretty good address, James at Kazekiel C A Z E K I E L. dot org. Okay, caller. Very good. Uh, and uh, my second question, am I to understand that uh, uh, when you refer to uh, Pleiadians, that uh, these are uh, from the Seven Sisters, the constellation, the little constellation, the Pleiades? They come from that region, but actually they're in a different time than, than we know it. Oh. So if we went there, we wouldn't. Uh, that That's basically the reference point they give us where they do a jump. I, I see because it would jump in time. 
I, I'm not much of an amateur UFOologist, but I've heard the term. Mm -hmm. And my comment is that uh, I'm I'm fairly keen with sound. I can recognize uh, when people do voiceovers and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I've heard something in popular culture that was almost identical to that sound. What was it? It was in the Charlie Sheen movie, The Arrival. Mm. And, it, and it wasn't when they actually, when he heard the signals. It was when they were in the artificial epidermis application room. Oh, in yes. Underground. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember that. Underground lair. I would have to compare it. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen that movie, but uh, I'd love to hear that sound. I've seen the movie. Uh, well, but what I was don't the movie again? Uh, it was uh, the arrival. The arrival. Yeah. The arrival. Ma okay. Martin Sheen was in that, right? I'll yeah, have to wonderful. go we're we're in that and check it out. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. That's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, and take care. Yeah, it's such a weird sound. And again, people in the audience should know that unless you have a bass system capable of reproducing the sound, it's not going to sound like much to you because it really is all at the low end. I mean, the real low end. Hold on, James. We're at the bottom of the hour. Once again, into the night. All right. James Gilliland is here from e -Seti and uh, uh, here he is again. James? Yes. All right. Let's go international. Um, on the international line, you're on the air with James. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from uh, Germany, stationed over here with the United States military. Yes, sir. Uh, good to hear from you. We've been hearing a lot of reports lately of uh, triangles sighted in Germany. Have you heard anything about that? I've heard about it, but I have not directly seen it. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask James if he's had any uh, any questions answered on uh, other civilizations that are out there, uh, especially those much like our own that are, have not quite developed to the point where uh, they can reach warp technology and and, uh, and time travel and stuff, just so we know where we are in the plane of the rest of the universe. Yeah, we're kind of at the low end, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Um, there are other beings that that have uh, the stuff that we've been working with is interstellar and interdimensional, and they're they're extremely advanced. Um, some of them, the best way to explain it, there's a vibrational continuum, and and everybody we, we're all multidimensional beings existing on this vibrational continuum. So though we have a physical body. Uh, we also have a mental, emotional, and spiritual body as well. And when a race starts evolving, they evolve more out of the physical body and become more of an energy body, you might say. And as they further evolve, they evolve into a light body. And as, as they further evolve along the vibrational con continuum, they go into just pure consciousness. So is, is that uh, on the same basis as... Uh Say the astral body when we uh, have uh, out of body experiences have they have they evolved to the point where they exist only within that astral body that itself it's they, they're a little bit beyond our frequency they have to drop their frequency down to uh, to work with us but they do have the technology to do that so their ships can go uh, you know time travel they can drop their frequency down and experience lower dimensions and higher dimensions as well. So, so they're very advanced beings, and there's, there are uh, other ones out there. It's the whole universe is full of life, and I guess, from what, from my understanding, there are some people that are are still quite primitive, you know, in in other systems. Right. Because there's there's I don't know what they're at now. There's something like 400 billion suns in the well. in the Milky Way galaxy, and then there's they've lost count on how many billions of galaxies there are. So. So it's just phenomenal the 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 uh, quotient for life out there. There's just so much. And uh, one more question, if I may, um, has the uh, the sound that you have recorded has it been tested, uh, say, through uh, depths of water to see what it would sound like through that and huh. through other atmospheric uh, mediums? Oh, that's a very interesting. Thank you all the way from Germany. Thank you for the call. That's a really interesting question, isn't it? You know, it, it almost sounds when you listen to the background noise, it sounds like it's in space or underwater. Yeah, it has a real strange sound to it. So uh, again, you've got to be able to reproduce um, 
with a lot of bass. You've got to have a lot of bass to really hear the full range of this thing. Mm -hmm. So I, that's all I would say. I know that a lot of people aren't hearing it properly on their radios. A lot of this needs more analysis, and, and it's brand new. I mean, the March 10th landing is very new, and we have shipped it out to certain people. And I, a couple of them I don't want to mention their name because... <laughs> You know, until we get the evidence back, because it might change the outcome. All right. Yeah, we don't want to do that. First time caller line, you're on the air with James Gilliland. Hi. Hi, James. This is Tim from Longmont. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do these beings believe in a higher power? Yeah, we've talked about that earlier. They do. They they believe in, in God. You might say they have a different uh, image of it than we do. It's much more expansive. Than the, than the images that most people have on Earth. I'll, I'll tell you what's really interesting is that I was giving a talk at Mount Shasta, and uh, a yogi was there. And when I showed these really large golden ships, the photographs we have of them, he just jumped up and down. And he got all excited. And he started saying, the Vamanas, the Vamanas. And he it's said, hard to get a yoga excited. Yeah. And he said, he goes, those are the, the gods, you know, the, the ancient gods that they refer to in their in their ancient text. So so it's kind of, uh, you know, in Ezekiel, he, he covers this quite a bit when he gives some pretty elaborate descriptions of uh, shiny metallic discs coming out of the firmament. And, That's true. Uh, they have cans, calves' feet that are bronze and fire and brimstone coming out from under, underneath them. They sound like a thousand rushing rivers when they, they land. So um, the, in Amos and Job, they talk about the Pleiades and Orion and, you know, the other systems. So... So it's uh, in all the ancient texts, and even on our site we have quite a few frescoes that are undeniable that have pictures of Mary and uh, and Jesus and Joseph in there with UFOs painted right into the background. Did so, they explain to you, to your understanding, uh, the concept of always was? Of what? Always was. Of always was? Yes. Yes, it's uh, timeless. Say what? I don't understand the always was. All right. Uh, I, well, I don't know if anybody understands always was. In other words, something that has always been is probably as incomprehensible to us yeah. as... Uh, if you, you know, don't do uh, time, you always are. <laughs> you know? As there being no end, you know, how high is the sky, Daddy? Yeah. Where does the sky end? Does it come to some sort of brick wall? Well, that's a concept we can't quite grasp. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about always was. In other words, there has always been something. Yes. Yeah, they explain it as... Uh, the, the best way they could explain it to me was they said it's the one consciousness that encompasses all consciousness on all planes and all dimensions throughout the multiverses. It's, and, and that same consciousness is within the individual. And we can expand that. Um, we can believe we're just a personality in the body or we can expand in consciousness and merge with the one consciousness. All right. Uh, a wild card line. You're on the air with James. Hi. Hey, uh, I got a couple questions here real quick. Um, you said that these things eat meat and other foods, too, that like we do. Well, I, I'm the one who threw in meat. Uh, he said primarily they're vegans, but a little bit of meat, I guess, somehow. So then, would that, would that uh, explain the cattle mutilations then, or...? Oh, now that's a good question. Cattle mutilations and crop circles are both good questions. Maybe James has some insight into those. Sure. Yeah, I do. Um, it seems that uh, that goes into, you know, a gray area, no pun intended, because there are lower level contacts, you might say. And, and when you start talking about the grays, which are the, the little guys with the black eyes uh, that most people hear about and talk about, um, that's where you have the cattle mutilation things going on and, and things of that nature. And some of the gray contacts seem to be uh, benevolent, and they don't have a problem with them, and some, some of them seem to be ma malevolent. So it looks as though that they're, they were doing a lot of experimentation with cattle because cattle are at the top of the food chain, and they can really check out the, the, the environment through the, the, the animals higher up on the food chain as, as far as, you know, all the contaminants and pollution. Well, if that is what they're checking on, it's no wonder they're concerned. Caller? Yeah, um, you also said that they've been in case of a nuclear war or something like that. So the, 
But what about like the life-threatening diseases that we can't cure? Will they step in with that pretty soon? Or? You know, it's it's uh, they have. It's sad because if you look at our society, um, we're pretty much run by the oil company, by the pharmaceutical companies, and and you really look at it in the war industry. And the the enemy of the war industry is peace, and the enemy of the pharmaceutical companies is you know the cure. And uh, you know the oil companies would be free energy, and so people wonder why is our planet so messed up right now? And to me, the answer is obvious: is that we have to uh, start demanding that our our leadership choose you know universal peace and brother sisterly love and a and a strong reverence for life and and uh, you know hold them to that as individuals, and then we'll turn this planet around, but. The way it's set up right now, um, you know, anytime you do come out with a cure, if it's a cheap, inexpensive cure, you're not going to see it. It's just going to disappear, get squashed, or or banned. But money, money rules, and everybody else walks. Old story, still, yeah. still as true today as ever. Unfortunately, well, I don't understand what is so wrong with stepping in with the evolution of us right now, though. If they're so far ahead of us, why not help us out? All right. Uh, that, yeah, I think that's a good question. Yeah, they, they are on certain levels, but their hands are tied again by free will. And a lot of us have chosen to support this kind of, of society. We've chosen to be a part of it, and we work within it and draw substance from it. So so it's kind of like, you know, we can't go in there and force somebody to quit their job, force somebody to not participate in pollution or for Yeah, that's all true. Yeah, yeah, you can't go in there and force people to change. People have to have to make that change within and well, act but on with, without having the transformational experience that you did, that change is rather unlikely, isn't it? Yes, yes, it's it's gonna be uh you know, I, I think the best thing that ever happened to me was that near death experience, the drowning I experienced, because 'cause I was in commercial real estate when it happened. And uh I had people working for me and I had the you know, the fast car, the boat, the truck, all that, you know, all the outer appearances. And, uh, you know, it, it did a major shift in my life, and I, and I let that go. And, and I'm fine with it. Gotcha. All right. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with James Gilliland. Hi. Hi, my name's Eric. I'm calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Yes, sir. I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask. The first one is um, with, with abductions. Uh, what have they said about this, um, the abduction of people and experimentation and so on? Here, here. Yeah, they've talked about that, and that goes back to uh, the Greys and some other government projects and things of that nature. So that's kind of, again, like I say, it's a gray area. It's, it's intertwined. It's mixed. And uh, the, what I'm seeing now is the abduction phenomenon is taking a whole new light. And where it was a lot of fear and uh, experimentation and things of that nature, the majority of it is changing right now, and it's becoming more of a teaching and learning experience and, a, and kind of a symbiotic relationship. It's, it's uh, changing its nature. There still is some negativity going on, you know, in the low-level contacts, but it is diminishing and being phased out. Okay, well, as far as physics is concerned, do they say anything about things like going forward in time, back in time, uh, and general physics about the universe that might be interesting? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, any anything about the nature of the universe and physics that either we have wrong or have yet to learn, or yeah, a lot of what they're giving us right now, believe it or not, is in the crop circles, and they're showing us where we went wrong along the line in physics, and and they're doing it through sacred geometry, and showing us how we have the formulas incorrect. Um, actually, I'm having a person here named Nassim Hariman, who's uh, just phenomenal in this in this area and he and he takes you all the way through uh, explains still point energy free energy the the uh, you know the universe and creation and the whole nine yards and talks about the crop circles and what's what they're trying to show us and uh, when he lays his uh, uh, the sacred geometry out and shows how you go from the tetrahedron on out um, in a dual you know universe the way we have a dual universe it all lays out, but we're only looking at one side of the spectrum, which is the radioactive side of the universe. It's the Big Bang or the expanding balloon theory. Right. But the problem is with an expanding balloon, you also have to have contraction on the other side. 
and they, they're saying there is no contraction. It's like an expanding balloon. Huh. And I love what Nassim says. He goes, well, what about the lungs blowing it up? <laughs> you know, so so this is how you get the still point energy. We have a generac a generoactive side of the universe and a radioactive side, and the still point is in the middle, and that's where that that just total unlimited energy comes from. All right, um, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with James Gilliland. Hi. Hi, this is Kanan calling from Burns, Oregon. Hi, Art. Hi there. Hello, Kanan. Um. I apologize if this has already been discussed because I worked during part of the show, but the um, question is regarding the sound. Um, I heard not very long ago that the scientist stepped out on the limb and said that uh, cats purr and actually heal themselves with that. That's fact, yes. And I was, uh, when I came in and heard that sound, the first thing that came to my mind <laughs> is it reminded me of that rolling purr of a cat, yep. and uh, yeah. I just wondered if that could be a sound that they you know, put in their environment to keep themselves healthy. Now, there's a cosmic pulse or like a heartbeat that goes throughout the universe that connects everything, and again, this is what's interesting is I asked them about that sound. Uh, the first thing I asked them, I go, what were you doing over Portland State University? And what they told me was it was called higher learning. <laughs> and so they're working with all the students over there in, in their dream state and in their sleep state. They're actually preparing them on different levels and teaching them. And uh, and it's also, a, yeah, it does have a real healing, calming effect when you hear that. Yeah, I just was immediately, like, relaxed. You could feel it in the in your chest. It was just very calming. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, well, it, it does trigger some very ancient... Uh, knowledge too it seems because I've seen people listen to that pulse and just just go into trance and and come back and go what happened wow. where'd I go and and uh, and they went into some old memories and started remembering all kinds of things all right caller yeah thank you very much okay thank you uh, I think we've got time for one more first time caller line you're on the air with James Gilliland hi hi I'm Dawn from Utah hi Dawn and I love your show thank you <laughs> new listener I was wondering if they'd ever had a situation. I was on my way to work one time when I was in California about 10 years ago, and I know I was on time when I left because I was still living at home at the time and, and spoke to my mother, but when I clocked into work, I was two hours late. Now, I know at some point I lost two hours of time, and but so I don't I know what I, occurred. So I suppose you went to your boss and said, listen, boss, I lost two hours. They, they thought I was an idiot, and I called <laughs> home to make sure that I was not losing my mind. It's a really original excuse, and I'm remembering it. Yes, but I'm wondering if that does they've happen. had people where the what had occurred during that two hours has come to them, because to this point, I don't know what went on in that two hours that I, that I lost. Yeah, I'll tell you um, what happened to me, and it's been documented, too. I was working in uh, remodeling a house. And I had to be in, in uh, Beaverton, Oregon, early in the morning. I took off at 8 o'clock, and I made it there. At 8.15, I was walking in the door. And this is about, you know, an hour-plus drive because I was going from the Dallas, Oregon. It's about an hour and a half drive or so. And uh, I did the whole drive in, in 15 minutes. And uh, when I walked in the door, I just was... You know, I didn't remember any scenery, anything, and I could not figure out how I got to the off-ramp so quickly. And so when I walked in the door, the person I was I was meeting there, I said, call back at the other place where I left. And we called, and I said, hey, you're not going to believe this. I'm in, in, in Oregon, and they didn't believe me. They thought I was on a cell phone. And to this day, neither one of them believe that I was at, you know, left one house and was at the other house. They're still struggling with it. Ma'am, I hate to cut you off, but... Uh, That's we're, fine. At least I know I'm not the only one. We're out of show. Uh, thank you very much you. for the call. James, we are out of show. Okay. We're out of time. You and I probably have other things we are going to be doing together Great. that we'll announce later. But for what you did tonight, uh, my eternal thanks. Oh, thank you. It was, uh, it was quite a job uh, explaining all of this. It's a lot to get out. Oh, there's much more. <laughs> I'm I'm sure there is, but for staying up late with us and explaining all of this, and and by the way, uh, good luck to your webmaster. 
<laughs> uh, that link is up there now, and I suggest you all go take a look at it right now. Okay. Otherwise, the website, give, give it to them. Uh, okay, it's eSETI.org. eSETI.org? And, yeah, and on the front page, too, are all the places I'll be speaking. And, all right, uh, E-C-E-T-I? Mm-hmm. Dot org. Dot org, all right. And I'll be speaking at all the conferences, you know, the major conferences and everything.